Yep, looks like we're good. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Rowena? Here. Mr. Shulman? Here. Mr. Johnson? Rod, you're I'm muted. Out of the here. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mancini? Here. Mr. Witherspoon? Here. Ms. Thomas? Here. Ms. Wells? Here. And, and we'll note if the other uh, commission members join us as we uh, get moving through. Just a reminder, if you're one of the applicants and you're not up at this point, please um, hide your video until your application is, is up. We'll, and we'll call those off. Okay, um, we have uh, two public hearings tonight um, and otherwise a fairly full agenda. Uh, so why don't we get started? Uh, first item uh, is a public hearing 4-20 SP, City of Norwalk Board of Education, Jefferson School, proposed additions and modifications. Uh, Alan, are you gonna lead that? Um, yes, I am. Good evening. Okay. You're up. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Alan Lowe from City of Norwalk. Uh, tonight I'm presenting a project on behalf of City of Norwalk. It's the Jefferson School Renovation Project. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the city has funded this project based on the need for satisfying enrollment shortage about 900 seats for elementary schools. So we had, we had built an addition to Pona School already and in the interim we're moving Jefferson in there uh, for a couple of years while we renovate Jefferson School. Uh, Jefferson School is about a 30, I think it's 35 or $8 million project. Uh, the school was built in the 1970s, around that time. And the city has not really spent any money in that building except a roof replacement back in 2000s. So the building is still on electric heat. Uh, and it says which the time that we need to do something with that building. The other issue is that we have a 10 portable classroom, making one of the highest popular, one of the higher pop populated school in the city's, in the Board of Ed uh, District. Um, the goal here is to remove the portable classroom and turn the school back into a reasonable sized neighborhood school. Um, so the school, I guess, I guess when, once we renovate it, this, the, the enrollment is going to be around 420 kids. Mm -hmm. Right now it's about a little about 500 and at the peak it's probably close to 600 seats, probably up to 500. So, by doing this project, we, are, we will be reducing traffic because enrollment will drop substantially. We also relocate the bus drop off in the lower section, which is closer to the intersection. So we relieve the, uh, relieve the pressure on the intersection a little bit and move the bus drop on the upper portion. We also renovating and making the parent pick up and drop off area a little bigger. So by separating all this and doing improvement, we, should, we are, and part of our goal is to improve the traffic condition in the neighborhood. Um, lastly, is that I think Jefferson is the one of the three remaining elements, elementary school that shares, the gym is shared with a, a cafeteria and auditorium. So part of this project, we're going to build a new gym uh, in the back portion of the property up in the upper portion. And that's basically it. We intend to go through the state for approval in the next few months and go out to bid in, in the middle of winter and start this project in January, February of next year. So tonight I have the architecture team here to present the project and then start with Mike Lasasso. He will go for the architecture portion of the project. Mike. Michael, you there? Oh, Lisa's doing it. Can you unmute yourself, please? I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, are you, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you now. Sorry about that. Good, ev good evening, everyone. My name is uh, uh, Mike Lasasso with uh, Antonazzi Associates. And uh, we're presenting tonight, as Alan said, the uh, Jefferson School Project. I'm joined tonight um, by our project uh, manager, Lisa Yates, and uh, also uh, Phil Katz, 
who's representing Stantec, uh, our civil and site engineer. Um, can you advance the slide, Lisa? Absolutely. Can I uh, ask you uh, if you have a second um, sound source on to turn it off because we're getting um, reverberation when you speak? Let me attempt to do that. Sorry. Is, is uh, that any better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So actually, um, I'm, I think at this point we'll have um, uh, Phil present the uh, site portion of, uh, of tonight's presentation, um, beginning with the aerial photograph that describes the existing site conditions. Phil, do you want to proceed, please? Sure. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is uh, Phil Katz. I'm a associate at Stantec in, in New Haven, a licensed PE with over 35 years experience. Uh, first, I'll take you through the existing site. Uh, we'll kind of start from the lower left and kind of go counterclockwise. So the school borders uh, Bedford Avenue, and that's where the uh, current uh, parents' uh, parking lot discharges. Um, that's the parking lot. Then as you're proceeding north, there's a drop off there uh, just west, I mean, just south of the school. Uh, orientation north is to the right on this plan. Um, so there's a drop off there. And then as you get to Grandview Avenue, uh, the buses currently, as Alan had, had uh, described, uh, come near the intersection of Grandview and Van Buren, go underneath the school and kind of turn around and then get back onto Grandview, uh, which isn't a great uh, condition. North of Grandview uh, is the staff parking lot. <clears throat> and then as you're proceeding up Grandview, uh, for those who aren't familiar, there's a big uh, topographic change going up the, up from Van Buren up to Prospect. I think it's about a two-story uh, change in grade between the front and the back. So in the, in the rear of the building currently, there are the uh, portable classrooms uh, that will be leaving. There's also a playground uh, two playgrounds actually, and a garden area that are in the rear of the parking lot, a uh, rear of the building. Um, let's go to the next one, uh, Lisa, if we could. This is the uh, site demolition plan. Again, beginning at the lower left corner, uh, the parking lot, the existing um, parent parking lot will be completely reconstructed. Uh, some of that is because we want to <laughs> fix grades. We also are going to put a stormwater detention system under it. So it's going to get dug up pretty good. Uh, we're going to take out the, the bus loop that's at the intersection there. Uh, totally replace, take that out. And uh, Lisa will share some things with the buildings, what's going to happen there. Uh, as you proceed up Grandview again, we're going to um, dig up the, um, the loading area. We're going to replace that. And then as you go to the rear of the lot, we'll take out the existing playgrounds and the portable classrooms. So those will be removed from the site. Uh, let's go to the next sheet. This sheet is the site um, layout and materials. Again, beginning in the lower left corner there. Uh, we're gonna reconfigure that driveway uh, onto Bedford, make it a little uh, easier to use. Uh, we're gonna regrade this parking lot so it'll, it won't come in as quite the angle as it does right now. Uh, as you're proceeding to, to the north, there's an area um, where we're considering putting in a potential uh, PV system, for, uh, the photovoltaic. Uh, we'll see how the, the budget looks for that, but that, that's in the vicinity of where that will be. Uh, we're adding islands and we're adding uh, plantings to kind of um, soften up that paved area. We're also adding lighting to that, those, that parking lot. Um, and then as you come further north toward the school, you can see we're extending that drive uh, closer to the school. So it shortens the distance that the uh, students have to walk to get into the building. We're also creating a little plaza to uh, have an area where they could enter and also wait for their parents. Um, just north of that, there's a playground um, that'll be constructed there. These, this is for the younger students. 
Uh, this will be uh, surrounded with a fence and whatnot um, for their security and whatnot. The other thing we're doing between the playground and the drop off is a set of stairs. Uh, this will bring the staff who's parking on the other side of Grandview uh, coming at the intersection using the existing pedestrian uh, signals that are there and then crossing and going into the main entrance there. Uh, as we proceed around the corner, coming up Grandview, again, we're gonna reconstruct the loading dock, kind of give them new pavement and new ramps and whatnot to get into the school. And then as you're coming up further on Grandview, we're creating a new bus drop off area uh, in the back. And this will be gated, so it'll only be used, it'll only be open during uh, drop off and pickup. Otherwise, there'll be no vehicles that'll be in that area. Uh, within the circle uh, of the drop off, we're creating a, a playground to replace the existing uh, playgrounds that are there. Um, and then we're also creating a drop off at the rear by the new addition and gym, which um, Lisa will describe for you. Um, if we could look get to the next sheet then. The next sheet is the uh, rating and drainage plan. A lot of confusion here, but I'll I'll just describe what's happening. We're, one of the big issues in the rear of the building is the uh, grades. All, it all pitches toward the building. So there's been some issues with water coming in the building and just creating some problems. So uh, we're putting some retention up in that area using oversized pipes. Um, there is some rock up there. So we were concerned about putting too much in there. So the balance will come down to the, the lower parking lot and there'll be a, a rather substantial uh, subsurface uh, detention system underneath the parking lot. So again, as we're, gonna, we're not increasing any runoff uh, based on what's actually going out right now, and we're also treating, treating the runoff to remove um, sediment from it. So it should be a much cleaner site with, with the, uh, these improvements. Um, let's see. In the, in the parent parking lot, the lower parking lot, what we're trying to do is we're gonna raise some of those grades. Uh, there will be material that from the rear when we're doing that regrading that we can use to raise that grade and kind of flatten it out a little bit. If you're familiar with the site, and Bedford is a pretty, pretty steep uh, ramp coming down into the parking lot. And then it kind of pitches up toward the entrance to the school. So what we wanna do is try and level that out a little bit um, to flatten those grades with uh, accessibility and things like that. And then along uh, Van Buren, there'll be a, a retaining wall, uh, which will hold some of that. It's a short wall, maybe two feet, something like that. Uh, oh, one of the things I didn't mention on the layout, but I can mention it here, is uh, we're putting in a sidewalk connecting Bedford Avenue uh, to the main entrance. Uh, it had been requested as uh, there's, there's pedestrians in the area, and that brings them into the school building. This will be a sidewalk separated by curb from the from the parking area. So it's providing a safe uh, passage to those coming to the front entrance. Um, if we go to the next plan. This is just a detail of the lights uh, that will be used. It's kind of a minimalist look. Uh, these will be LED lights with full cutoff. So there's no um, light being uh, extended over the property line. And these are, I believe, 15 foot um, poles that will be used. Uh, that's a summary of the site. I'll pass it on to Lisa to describe uh, the architectural work. Sure, thank you, Phil. So I'm gonna start us off with a few isometric views of the building and then move quickly through the plans. Uh, th this is, so Van, Van Buren is here and Grandview is on this side. This is the loading dock. So this, this is our new entrance. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do when I show you the plans, um, we reconfigured the interior so we were able to put the entire administrative wing on the first floor and we have a secure front entrance. The idea behind this, um, since th this is for parents and you know kids being dropped off, but this, this is the main point of entry and all of our security happens here. This area where the bus drop off used to be will be infilled. Uh, one of, this is also not only adds square footage, but it's better for security to not allow vehicles to pass below the building. And back here, by the way, everything in here that's green is new. Uh, this is the new gymnasium addition. And this is the 
new upper terrace entry for the buses and for um, ingress and egress for use of the playgrounds and that sort of thing. So this is this is a view from uphill and this kind of shows you a little bit better the serious grades. This this line is a retaining wall in the existing building. So on this side, which is the west side, we have one story and on the other side we have three. And Lisa, uh, if I may, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you secure the back of the building? So the back of the building is, is also secured with the timed lock, but the man trap would be in the front. So was, the idea is um, it would be open when the buses come or at other times, say if they wanted to have it open for recess or outside events, but it could be always locked other times. Uh, are you planning any improvements to the fencing, particularly at the back of the building? We are looking into um, replacing the fencing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned this because when I was there uh, last week, uh, there were three uh, guys playing soccer. Uh, they, they weren't mm -hmm. uh, causing any mischief, but they were on the property playing soccer and were able to exit by just climbing over the fence. Which, which area were, were they in a high portion of the fence or somewhere? Uh, they were in the back. Yeah, yeah. On, on prospect. Mm -hmm. As long as they're not climbing over the fence over here. There's a 20 foot drop. Hey, uh, Lou, uh, Lou let, yeah. let, me just re let me just respond to the question about public use. <clears throat> During the school hours, the school is it's limited for school use only, as you probably know. Um, the rear entrance is really for when the bus come off, there's a teacher there to receive the kids and stuff. After that, it would be locked during the day. Uh, but when they have recess and stuff, kids would come out, so be, they would be uh, monitored by teachers at that opening. The gates at the gate would be closed so that the general public doesn't get to the back. Once the days are over, that become, once the school hours are over, it becomes a public park. So public access uh, should be made available to the public. Um, in fact, one of the things we try to do is, uh, I'm not sure what we haven't talked about in detail, but if we put a fence back, we mean that's a high fence. It's like a 10 or 12 feet high fence. I'm not sure we're going to do that anymore because what happens is the higher the fence is, people try to climb it. It's more of a danger issue, safety issue. Mm -hmm. um, we find that typically, I mean, it's uh, getting off of attention, but typically when we do a fence around property line, is usually it's about, I would say about, I would say six feet is probably most we would do. Mm -hmm. um, it really prevents people from throwing furniture over the, over the fence. But if somebody want to, a teenager want to mm -hmm. over it, they're going to climb over it. So we're not going to stop those. In fact, we don't want it too, too high so that in case they fall down, it would be a liability issue. So those are the sensitivity about fencing. But generally speaking, after hours, it will be open. Okay, thank you. So in addition to solar in the parking lot being a consideration, a more likely consideration would be uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof. And this is a preliminary layout for these. We're still looking at how this works within the budget. Uh, it's a 120 kilowatt system. And I uh, just want to add one and uh, it's like 90% chance we do these solar panels. The number is working out okay. There's about maybe 10% chance we do the parking lot because the parking lot uh, solar panel requires whole structure and foundation. So it adds a lot of cost on the capital cost. Mm -hmm. So it's not. Uh, the number doesn't look like feasible to do it, but we're still considering it. So again, there's 90% chance we do the roof, uh, roof solar panel, there's 10% chance we do the parking lot. So to quickly take you through the floor plans, this is the first floor. So this is our main entrance. We have um, a separate entrance and exit vestibule. So this sort of functions like a man trap. The security is right off of the vestibule and the administration wing is adjacent. We have kindergarten and pre-kindergarten on this side and first grade on this side. Mechanical spaces are down here and then up a half a level we have receiving where it currently is. On the second floor, and again, these spaces, um, since, since Jefferson was a magnet school and is becoming a neighborhood school again, we're really standardizing the classrooms to allow for future flexibility. These uh, resource rooms, the, the way these walls are designed in the future, if they're needed, if needed, we can remove them and these can become full classrooms as well. Uh, we, we also stacked the second and third floor for further efficiency and this is second grade, 
third grade. This is now the, just the cafetorium, no longer the gymnasium. We're maintaining the stage. This is an entirely new kitchen uh, in the same location as the old kitchen with a more open servery line and there's a lot more space for students to eat. The third floor, again, as I said, we were stacking. We have now fourth grade and fifth grade. This is uh, the cafetorium below. And this is, this is the entrance to the upper terrace area and the gymnasium and support spaces for the gymnasium. And this is also set up. So in addition to having a card reader and timed entry here, we're capable of locking this off here for community events in the gymnasium. That is the quick run through of the plans. Questions from commissioners on uh, design? Lou, I have a question. Um, in the plans, it looked like there was a couple of trees to be removed. And I'm just curious why. So I think I know the ones you mean. I'll let your talk. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. some along the uh, rear. Those, those are right. growing into the retaining wall and are causing damage to that retaining wall. So if those are left, we're going to rebuild a retaining wall. So uh, we're, we're replacing trees. I mean, they're not going to be obviously the same size, whatever, as the existing ones, but uh, it's, it's not a good condition of how they're, they're growing through the wall. And then the second question is, there was a garden in the, in, in, in the existing area. Are you redoing the garden or is that going to be scrapped due to space confinement? So the, the space is here, but the, the garden is not right now. And Alan, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I really don't have too much comment on this. It's really a, a board of ed program thing. Sometimes it was parents and teachers in, in the school that are interested in doing it, they do it. But with, with, with the parent leaves the school or the teacher leaves, sometimes it disappears. So we, we provide a space, but whether it happens or not, it's up to the school administration where they want to do it, where they have the staff or, or, or parent interest to do it. And uh, again, if I don't, we're not going to put anything in until there's an interest. And then sometimes interest only go, lasts for a couple of years, whatever it may be, and then people lose interest. So it's, uh, uh, we welcome the idea, but at the same time, it's, uh, the space is there. It's up to the school to decide what, whether they're, they're interested in doing it or not. And then third and final question, um, where the staff parking lot is, is there going to be any safety features like a walk bridge or something to, to connect the main property to the to the staff parking because that's always a concern of mine having watching people cross the traffic on Grandview even though it's not as congested but in the morning there's a lot of traffic over there and I was wondering if there's any plans or any considerations for that safety well what we were doing is is we've eliminated the mid block crossing uh, and and had the crossing down at the down at the intersection so that, that people can cross with the lights. There's pedestrian uh, lights and poles that are there. Uh, so we, instead of having them cross mid block, we're crossing them where they have a signal and eliminate that other crosswalk. So that's one of the things that we're doing to have a, a safer crossing there. You're also but moving the driveway. The thing, yeah, but I was gonna the say the same thing. No, that, that, that goes out the window. I've seen other projects where they put, you know, a, a small walk bridge over where they would climb stairs and walk over. So, you know, you're not com competing with, with the street. I think uh, the addition of a, a bridge or walkway over a public uh, road would be a, um, a significant addition. I mean, that would, that would require um, quite a bit of uh, elevation and so forth. Well, you know, one of the things we can do, you know, short of that is maybe put a, a fence, you know, a short fence along Grandview um, so they can't cross in mid block and they're forced to go down to the intersection and cross with the light. That would be a relatively simple mm -hmm. thing to do um, if the commission desires that. And I, I, um... I just want to note that these are these are staff parking, so it's really just it's not it's not all day long. It's when they come to, when they come in the morning, they park the car once and then we leave in the, in the afternoon. So 
uh, is, it should be a manageable thing, but again, people do what they do. Uh, but we are, we are encouraging them to cross at the intersection instead of mid block, so. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I think we I think that we finished presentation on the city spot. All right, uh, Alan, I would like you to address just one more issue. Um, you have asked us um, to uh, eliminate the need for a traffic study. I'd like you to address that. Okay. Yes. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. The the way um, we actually this this project was sent to the state DOT. Uh, for their to 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 see there any requirement because it's on on a, on, a, on a state road, and they did not feel the need to do a traffic study. Um, I think fundamentally the project has did a couple of things. One is that we 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 reducing the population in schools. So whatever condition we have currently, it's actually reduced. We are right now again used to be about maybe five fifty to five seventy kids. Now we're down to five hundred right now. Five oh five, I think it is. This school is going to go down to 420 or so, or a little less than that. So we are reducing population by maybe 15 to 20% uh, further than what is now. So it is a definite reduction in terms of traffic activity and volume. Uh, second of all, is that we are moving the bus turn or uh, bus drop off to upper portion, so it impact the intersection less, and that creates less of a um, congestion at the corners. So, and also the um, if you look at the uh, parent drop off and pickup. We made the little longer. It's not substantial, but it's a little bit longer. But that that gives the ability to stack costs, probably maybe three more costs or something like that. And also, uh, Jefferson is one of the largest walk to school schools. Most more kids will walk to Jefferson than any other school in the system. So, with all those considerations, we are requesting that we waive the traffic study because the traffic study we go into traffic count and signal signal count and stuff. But it really has no. I mean, based on the, the realistically, there's no negative impact on it. We are doing three, three, two or three things at least to improve the traffic conditions. Thank you, Alan. Uh, are there uh, any other questions from the commissioners uh, before we close the hearing? Um, uh, is there any uh, comment from uh, the public? I see that Diane has her hand up. Okay. So I'm gonna allow her to talk. And okay. See if this is what she wants. And, and Michelle, um, and, uh, or maybe Larry, what if somebody's dialing in? What is the what they hit star? And I know there's a number they hit if they want to talk. I believe it's star seven to raise your hand if you're dialing in by phone and listening in. If you want to speak. Uh, hit star seven on your phone, and I believe it will raise your hand electronically. I think it's star six, but... Star six? I thought so, but they could try both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of those two. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, Diane Loricella? <clears throat> can you hear me? We can. <laughs> that's, that's the first line of every Zoom call nowadays. Anyway, good evening, um, and thank you, Michelle and Steve, for fixing that link, and uh, Larry in IT. There was no link up until a moment ago. Anyway, tonight I uh, have been uh, following the Jefferson Elementary School uh, construction project for many months, uh, on and off, and have appeared at other uh, meetings where this uh, application winds through the system, including the Council Land Use and Building Management Committee, uh, and also spoke with the Board of Ed. There are really many good improvements here, and I'm so pleased that the plan is to get rid of those horrible um, trailers in the back. Uh, it's taken a long road, and I appreciate Alan and others who have made that happen, and the kids will be at PONUS for a little while. But I ask that this particular project go back to the drawing board when it relates to the way we utilize electricity on this site for the school. That is, I don't feel yet that this uh, project team has been allowed to, uh, to uh, maximize or optimize the solar panel 
um, usage. And you will be told by Alan that, uh, as he did reveal, that there's really only 10% of a chance that solar will be used on the parking lot. I, I'm not sure if this is a uh, just Alan's unfamiliarity with how other schools have used uh, these um, carports, but I would like the uh, Antinazi Associates and uh, and Stantec or whoever would, I don't know if Green Skies is going to be used anymore, but I'd like to know at least from Stantec about how many square feet the, the lower, on the map that they showed, the lower left parking lot, how many square feet of surface area is that lot? And then how many square feet roughly is the uh, staff parking lot? I'm not suggesting that every square foot of both parking lots could be used with solar panels, but I am suggesting that we could save the taxpayers a lot of money if that would be created so that there could be solar panels on the carports. There are benefits to carports, no matter what Alan will tell you about how they cost more, the cost benefit uh, ratio has not been properly reviewed because we will be gaining uh, electrons that we will be through a PPA, we will save money and add to the curriculum enhancement of the children. I do believe that we could have solar panels and carports on both parking lots or at the very least at the lower left hand near towards um, Long Island Sound, whatever direction that is in. Um, and you will be told that that cannot happen. Please do not listen in this case, to Alan. He and I have been banging heads on this for months, and I will be pursuing this no matter what the vote is tonight, because there is just a need to optimize solar usage in all of our schools. PONUS will just have a partial uh, on the new construction. In the case of this particular school, I'm very pleased that there will be solar panels on the roof. But if Antonazi Associates is told not to consider a carport, they won't consider it. I'm a consultant too. And if my client either tells me not to look someplace or I suggest something and they say no, I'm not going to do it if I want to keep my job with them. And Antonazi has the ability to at least give you uh, a suggestion of how you could benefit by having at least one of the two parking lots with solar panels on them. There are benefits to carports. In the winter, there's no snow on the cars to clean off and ice to um, clean up, at least not in the main portion. In the summer and the warmer weather that we're experiencing now with climate change, it's cooler. Underneath, there's shade. And other school districts have employed carports with no problem that Alan will tell you he feels will be encountered. Fairfield School District is one of those. Lastly, I wanted just to say, so that I don't believe that there should be a 10% chance of the parking lots having solar on them. It should be 100% chance and 100% chance for roof solar. Lastly, the notch of the new, the front entrance could be filled in structurally, and then there could be more solar panels placed atop that. Again, if Antonazi Associates and others employed by the city are not asked to design such a design, they will not do it. And I feel that we need to optimize creating electrons so we reduce the cost to the taxpayer and we enhance the children's curriculum enhancement. In addition, if you fill in the front notch, and I, and I, there's no, um, if you all understand what I'm saying, the, the front entrance, which is kind of still an open notch where they will have the, the man catcher, you know, facing the state road, that could be filled in and that could provide uh, safety, uh, that could provide um, protection from the rain and snow. It could provide uh, shade to make it cooler. We have the heat island effect that's taking place now. 
uh, and it will provide a place for the solar more more so roof solar panels to perch. Um, so uh, for those areas that want, so mainly I just wanted to to say that because I have been trying to get our city to handle this on the school system uh, enhancements, renovations, and additions, and the buildings in Norwalk for more than two years. Alan and I have done this dance, and unfortunately, I've come to the end of my patience as far as trying to have a true conversation with the city of Norwalk. The council has decided to listen to Alan alone. I love, I love Alan, but on this topic, he and I have parted ways. I ask that you ask for, at least at this meeting tonight, the square footage of both of those parking lots so that you can at least have some kind of image of how much solar panel we could put atop them and that could be used by the school as well. I appreciate the time you are giving me to say this. I wish you luck. Again, there are many, many good improvements. Oh, lastly, I wanted to say I am from Newtown. I went to high school and junior high in Newtown and I've spoken with some folks from District A, especially some of the council members, and there's some doubt as to whether the back entrance is safe enough. So I ask, even when you're having, I'm, you can lock out the public from the rest of the school building, but, but I think there should be a man catcher, if that's the term of art, placed in the back entrance as well. I think that that is a red flag on the field because it does not seem to be a safe way to handle the back entrance. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else uh, from the public who wishes to speak? See anyone else? All right, if not, um, we'll turn it uh, uh, back to um, Alan uh, for uh, response to comments. You sure you want, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know how to respond to those since you asked that the, the consulting commission not to listen to me. Uh, but I do have a responsibility to respond to the consulting commission. Um, It's a, it's a financial decision. I have received a cost proposal from Green Skies who's developing the solar system for us and now analyzing the solar, solar panel system for us. <clears throat> is this, they give us number that basically we break even. Is, is at some point it becomes the city's decision whether we put it, if it breaks even or not. Um, so the council need to decide on whether that's feasible the other problem I have on this site and this location is that we are putting in a whole drainage system, uh, the, the retention area underneath. Uh, detention, not retention, detention area. And it structurally create, creates a problem because any kind of a, uh, uh, um, car port solar system needs a, a rack system. More than, it's not service rack, it's actually kind of leave out with, uh, with columns, and, and, columns and, and foundation that need to be supported. That's why it adds to your cost. Unlike a roofing system, you put it flat, not really flat, we put a rack system on top of, of a roof. But here, you got to structure design it so that it's actually can't leave us so it's a, a, a truck because we, we snow power with trucks. We have to be able to get underneath and things like that. So there's different considerations. So Diane can disagree with me, but you know, that's between me and her at some point. But I don't, I don't, we are doing, I believe on behalf of the city is doing the right thing to look at all these options and consider them and look at the financial aspect of the benefit of the pro or each component. If the roofing system is beneficial financially, it works for us, uh, I would recommend it do it. If we break even, I would not recommend it, but the cities have a choice. I mean, other community may do it because they want to do a PR project. They may be actually losing money, but I don't know, I'm speculating. But regardless, it's their decision. So at some point, I'm going to look at these number again from Green Skies, and if it makes sense, there's no reason why I do not want to do it, right? I mean, if it's saving money for, 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 for what's the payback period? I mean, all that we got to look into. If it's worth it, then I would recommend we do it. If it's not, then my recommendation is not, but the city may decide to, please may want to do a pilot program, even though it, 
and certain costs that say they're willing to do it, that's the city's choice. So I just want to leave you with that because uh, I'm not anti this or whatever, but you know, if she doesn't see the way I see things, it's her choice as a citizen of Norwalk. But at the same time, we, we have done everything we can in terms of look at each aspect of it. Uh, the total square footage, you can't cover the whole site for various reasons because the travel way and stuff, and then now you got more column, more structure, you just add to the overall cost at some point, it becomes a cost issue. So I just want to stop. Thank you. Uh, Alan, uh, when you're calculating uh, the cost benefit, uh, what do you typically uh, use uh, as the uh, payback period? Um, solar system a little different because the lease is 20 years. <clears throat> And it's not, it doesn't pay back the first year. It doesn't pay, it's, it's, we had to look at the overall lane and figure probably by like, we save this, the solar panels generate electricity. So we do not buy that portion of electricity from the grid. So from the grid, we pay probably like 11 cents, 11.3 cents a, a kilowatt hour. And we are paying the solar company about probably about five or six cents a kilowatt. What it does is the city do not buy the system. We don't put capital costs into it. We call, as Diane mentioned, it's a power purchase agreement, which is a PPA. What we do is release the system from a, from a solar developer. The reason why we do this is that they can capture tax benefit while city cannot uh, tax credits. So if the city is going to do this, we end up with a capital cost, and then we don't have the tax benefit to reduce the, the overall capital cost. By leasing it, we have the ability, the, the private sector, the ability to tax credit and lower the capital cost. But meanwhile, they make a profit on it. And, but in return, we pay for that through um, for a long-term lease for 20 years. So that's why when she, Diana mentioned about bonus, we only do on the new portion of the roof because the old portion of the roof, it's old, but it's probably 10, 10, 15 years old and we have leasing already. So I, I, and there's mechanical systems on it. So we are not, we do not look at the existing roofs. We designed the new building and new roof to take on a solar system. So it's by design. Uh, but back to your question, it's whether it be, like lighting system where you do retro, retrofit, it's about three to seven years the most for a payback period. Any more than that, it's a technology changes by then already. But solar system, we don't have a choice. We have to lease it for 20 years. So again, there's really no payback because we are not put up capital costs, but then the payment goes on. So every year we save some money, it could be $300,000 in 20 years, but it all depends on the cost of the system, orientation, how many panels and everything that goes with it. So, yeah. And um, we went out for a proposal from, uh, for, uh, for a solar developer probably like five years ago, um, maybe four years ago. And we, right now, I think, I think, it's actually the contrary of the Board of Education. So I think they're working on narrow mix school. I'm not sure it's finished or not. I think it may be finished by now. Uh, the next one is uh, Ponus and Jefferson is our third one. So my intention, I'm talking to purchasing department. We're looking to possibly go out to RP again to see what the next grouping, because Green, Green Skies, with this project, they would, be, they would have done three projects for the city. So we want to look at what's available, what technologies are maybe different from moving forward. So, so we will probably go for another the RP process to, uh, to look at what's available in the marketplace. Okay. Uh, is there anything more uh, uh, you wish to say uh, in the form of uh, uh, conclusion? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, commissioners, uh, any other questions or comments? All right, if not, we will close this uh, hearing uh, and we'll move on. Um, I will, um, I'd like to note that um, Commissioner Sumter and uh, Commissioner uh, Goldstein um, have uh, joined us uh, this evening and uh, uh, that, should, that should go into the record. Thank you. Uh, our uh, second public hearing, uh, 3-20SP slash 1-20CAM, 310 Wilson Avenue, web construction, uh, new contractor storage yard with outdoor material uh, storage. And I believe that's Attorney Suchi. Yes, it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, members of the commission. Thank you for taking the time on a summer evening to conduct this hearing. 
the Zoom platform seems to be working well, and I appreciate your efforts and your time to keep business moving for my clients and others in the city. Uh, this evening, we will be presenting to you the application for special permit in coastal area management short form on behalf of web construction. With me is Matt Pop of Environmental Land Solutions and Dean Martin of Grumman Engineering. Matt is the uh, um, uh, landscape architect, soil scientist, who will discuss the coastal resources and policies involved in this project. Dean Martin of Grumman Engineering is our civil engineer. And also on the line is probably James Bernia, one of the principals of web construction. For the record, I delivered to uh, the city PNZ Dropbox this morning or, yet, or last evening the green domest domestic return receipt cards, which evidence mailing of all to all abutting property owners and those directly across the street. We also did send a letter uh, to the leadership of Village Creek per Commissioner, uh, com Mr. Chairman's uh, request, and that was done as well. So to start off, uh, you saw this once at a committee, uh, not a committee meeting, but in preliminary review earlier this month, late last month, the proposal is by Web Construction, which is a sub subsidiary of um, FGB Construction. The property is 310 Wilson Avenue. It's District 5, Block 84, Lot 200. It's part of a three-tracked, um, one portion of a three-track portion that you reviewed back last fall in connection with a lot line revision that was presented and approved by Crystal LLC, which is a Grasso subsidiary. The property is about 2.4 acres in size and it's zoned industrial number one, and it is within the coastal area management boundary. Um, Dean, would it be possible, um, this is to Dean Martin, could you call up one of the aerial maps while I'm moving forward? Um, the application was submitted to the city on March 18th. Notification to neighbors of the submission was sent March 19th. And then July 2nd, uh, certified mailing to all budding property owners, as I mentioned before, was taken care of. Um, the general neighborhood, to give you an idea of what's around it, is largely industrial. Uh, LeBlanc's, LaJoy's, Grasso Construction, F&G, City Carding, DHL, and other industrial users, including the city bus depot, surround the property or are located in close proximity. The property itself that's the subject of this application is virtually vacant. There aren't any structures or drainage. There's limited vegetation, but it used to be used as a roadway from the north across the back end down to where the Grasso parcel is more, more largely developed. There are some tidal wetlands that exist off a corner of the property. Uh, there are approximately 0.6 acres of wetlands on the property. And because of that purpose, because of that existence, we presented to and received from the Conservation Commission an, approv an approval on June 30th of this year, and that permit should be in the file and made part of the permanent record. Uh, the wetlands function as groundwater recharge, sediment retention, and <clears throat> nutrient removal. <clears throat> the proposed use, as uh, the legal notice indicated, is a contractor's yard for the storage of aggregate materials produced by web, const web construction directly next door at a fully permitted rock hush indoor rock crushing facility at 34 Meadow Street. Uh, if all approvals are secured, materials, can, materials created at 34 Meadow Street, which is on the right of this screen in the kind of um, um, off the screen, it, and it indicates NF, Norman LeBlanc, and Lorraine LeBlanc. That's the existing rock crushing facility that Dean is pointing to with the arrow right now. If all approvals are secured, aggregate that's processed on, in that facility would then be transported across the 50 foot right of way that divides this property from the uh, proposed 2.3 acres, and it would be stored in the various material storage bin areas identified on this plan. Um, there is no anticipation or no um, expectation of increase in the number of employees or the, the truck fleet. This would simply be an extended area for material storage. As many of you are probably aware, material storage for rock crushing and other similar types of construction materials can only be stored in certain specific locations as identified on approved site plans. Uh, the materials that are created at 34 Meadow Street are right now approved to be stored outdoors adjacent to the building and they must be covered at all times and cannot exceed a height of 20 feet. So the excess aggregate that is processed at 34 would be then stored in the material storage bin areas noted on the plan in front of you, 20 feet high maximum uh, height of pile and then covered at all times with whatever type of dust suppression system is necessary. A similar dust suppression system exists at 34 Meadow just to make sure that dust is kept to a minimum. 
Um, there had been a question, I think, by Mr. Sumter as to what happened, what's it used for, what does it look like, what is the material that's produced? Well, aggregate materials are used for sublayers of roads, sidewalks, school buildings, playing fields, under foundations. It's the subsurface for the majority of the construction that you see. It also creates a bed for sewer water and other utility lines, because that's the kind of material that's produced. And uh, in response to Commissioner Sumter's question, we did provide a, uh, a memo with some photographs of the materials that are produced at 34 Meadow Street, how it's produced, what it looks like, what the final product is, um, and where it goes. So the top, the top image that you see on this screen with the arrow, that is the web construction indoor crushing facility. To the right of that, that building, uh, to the, I guess it would be the east of where the city carting containers are located is an area that looks like it's dirt or sand, sandy color. That would be the area that would be largely used for material storage. Again, it's 2.3 acres, but only about a half acre would be proposed for material storage. The rest of the property from a southerly end all the way to the end of the property next to where it abuts 3, 314 Wilson Avenue would be revegetated uh, with native plantings, shrubs, trees that don't exist today. Um, at this point, um, I would like um, uh, Dean Martin to walk through this site plan if he could. And then after Dean, uh, we can hear from Matt Pop to talk about coastal area issues and like. So Dean, if he could be unmute. Unmuted, I will mute myself and. Okay, I'm not sure if I can share my screen yet. Let's see if I can find my file. Well, while Dean's working on that, I just wanted to let you know some of the projects that web construction is currently involved in in the city of Norwalk is our uh, projects at Nathan Hale and Conus Ridge the Maritime Aquarium, uh, ongoing construction of a new structure you approved last year at 320 Wilson Avenue, Sono Gardens in South Norwalk and other um, businesses and other private projects such as Cove Marina and there are also many projects other projects smaller ones in the city of Norwalk and in other local municipalities uh, nearby. Um, Dean are you good or not? Well I'm um I thought I could get my, my site plan up there, but it's not coming up. It was just up before. Nuts. Okay. Yep. There, oh, you go. there we go. Okay. Dean, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, again, Dean Martin, professional engineer with Grumman Engineering LLC. Uh, as, as Attorney Suchi noted, this is a uh, total parcel of 2.35 acres, um, of which 0.52 acres is proposed to be utilized for the uh, material storage yard. Um, the site, which is bounded on the um, east by the uh, wetlands and the uh, tidal, tidal, uh, tidal area, uh, bounded on the south by uh, additional area of the parcel three, and on the east and, uh, uh, pardon me, on the west and the north by other industrial sites. Um, the proposal is to uh, divide this parcel into several uh, material storage bins. Uh, there will be a, a concrete block wall surrounding the uh, material bins on the western side. That'll be a 20 foot tall wall. On the south side and along the western side of the, of the material storage area, uh, there will be a concrete curb, which will stand approximately eight inches above grade. And then just on the outside of the concrete curb will be a 20 foot high uh, chain link fence. Uh, and the fence will have uh, uh, privacy screenings on it. Um, and the reason for the, for the 20 foot uh, high fence and not 20 foot high wall is, such, is so that tarps can be placed over the uh, material storage piles as, you, as was previously mentioned uh, the, the maximum height of the piles is 20 feet, therefore everything can be covered. Um, the area on the northern portion of this site, uh, which is a, the access point, will be paved and then immediately to the south of the paving will be a permanent uh, anti-tracking pad. Um, we've provided stormwater retention consisting of 
an oil separator unit and uh, catch basin and some below ground stormwater retention, which is sized to collect runoff from a high point just to the west of, or just to the south of the anti-tracking pad, collect all the runoff from the paved area and get that back into the ground. That will provide uh, the, uh, or ensure that there will be a zero increase in runoff from the site. Additionally, uh, the, the material storage area the, where the piles will be, the surface will be covered with uh, millings, which is essentially crushed asphalt. Uh, now, we're proposing to uh, install a stone infiltration trench along the inside and underneath the uh, concrete curbing along the uh, western, um, pardon me, along the eastern side of the material storage yard. That will collect all the, uh, the runoff and provide the water quality storage volume uh, as requested by the Department of Public Works. Um, as previously mentioned, there will be plantings, uh, arborvitaes or, or other plantings placed along the uh, existing dirt driveway, which uh, connects down to other properties to the south. Um, along the exterior of the chain link fence will be planted uh, a row of arborvitaes, seven to eight foot tall, spaced approximately six feet on center. Um, that'll go, as noted on the site plan, from the south, along the south side, all along the eastern side, and along the northern side of the material storage yard. Uh, our erosion controls will consist of uh, siltation fencing to be installed during construction um, for temporary measures. The permanent measures will include the, uh, a filter fabric, uh, which will be installed along the uh, bottom four feet of the chain link fence, as well as the um, anti-tracking pad, which will be a permanent feature and will be maintained by the owner. Um, I think that about covers it. Anyone have any questions of um, Mr. Martin? Um, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now that 20 foot high chain fence and then the other 20 feet high fence, as I read in some of your background, what was the difference between having that and originally or having the three feet high when, where the 20 feet high, was it proof? Was that now proof? Yeah, the original plan had a 20 foot high concrete block wall surrounding the entire material storage yard. And uh -huh. through discussions with the Connecticut DEP, uh, it was decided that the, uh, the uh, concrete block wall was not in alignment with their regulations. Uh, therefore, it was decided and, and, and through discussions with the DEP, it, they decided that, that having a small curb along the outside of the material storage area and a, and a fence would meet their requirements. Uh, and it would also allow us to be able to still maintain uh, a point to place the uh, coverings over the material storage piles. And what about the runoff? Uh, stormwater runoff. Yeah, and the sediments. Yep, they, that, as I mentioned, we have a, a stone infiltration trench, which will be along the inside of the, the eight inch high concrete curbing, along the exterior, the south and the eastern sides of the material storage yard, which will uh, collect sediments, get those back into the ground, provide for the water quality volume runoff from the site. And as, well all as, as well as the uh, system which is underneath the pave, pavement in a northern portion of the site which provides uh, retention of the increased runoff volume. And has all that been approved? That has all been approved by the DP Department of Public Works, yes. Did you need an approval by the state or someone from the state? Um, I don't believe so at this no, point. We did not. The work that's proposed is outside the jurisdiction of DEP. It is landward of the coastal jurisdiction line. However, DEP does have the ability to comment on a plan that's within the coastal area. And that is what gave rise to the discussions between 
Mr. Martin and John Goucher of DEP and the changes to the plan. Uh, just so that it's clear, and sometimes I, I, I'm not clear, I, I go a little bit too fast. Uh, if you're looking at the plan in front of you, on the top side of the plan, it says Meadow Street Partners and the area in question we've highlighted in yellow. Um, uh -huh. The boundary between that Meadow Street Partners and, and the yellow where our proposed material storage is, there's already a 20 foot high concrete block wall there on the Meadow Street Partners side. We're proposing our block wall on our side of the property, but only along that line that, that um, um, divides Meadow Street Partners and um, web construction. If you come further south toward the bottom of this page and you, you come out of that yellow area, and you'll see the, the circles, those are all the trees that Dean was just discussing. Those, uh -huh. are, the those are the trees on the outside of the, the curb, but on the inside of the curb is the trench that he's talking about. So this plan shows Meadow Street Partners, they have their block wall, this property line, we would have our block wall, moving south on, moving down to the bottom of the page, materials would be stored, then moving further down in, in the area, there would be the, the trench, there would be the, the low curb, and then the outside of that curb would be the um, plantings and the fence. Maybe that made it a little clear. I think I was unclear at the outset. And those plantings will grow to what height? Um, I think if we could just hold off on that, we'll answer that question when Matt Pop gets on because okay. of landscape architect. One other okay. comment though, um, Mr. Sumter, is this will require a general, a general permit from DEP but that permit is only applied for after local approvals have been granted. But we do know that we need a general permit. Uh, that's what it's called from Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And we have anchor engineering services ready to move forward with that once local approvals are all, are all granted, if in fact that's what you decide to do. I have a, I have a question, um, two questions actually. I understand from some of the reading that the, this, this material, aggregate material, has to be a hundred uh, place several feet above the grade level to meet the hundred year flood requirements. So that seems like a pretty heavy load to put up several feet. Have, is, is that something that you want to address? And the other question I have is when you're talking about crushed asphalt, asphalt has some really serious uh, pollutants in it. And I assume that those, none of those are going to be leaching through into the water, that that's something that you've considered. Uh, may I just, I'd like to respond to the second question and then I'll leave the first question to Dean. Uh, one of the questions that had been raised is what type of um, um, elements, for lack of a better word, may appear in the aggregate that's produced. My client does uh, quarterly testing, it's required to do so for any of the projects that it has, particularly those projects that it provides aggregate for, for uh, the Department of Transportation. And just uh, the end of June, um, the aggregate was sampled and all of the levels that of lead, selenium, cadmium, chromium, arsenic, barium, and silver that we have to test for uh, came in well below not only the industrial levels, but far, far below any residential levels that would be deemed unsafe or, un, um, or necessary for some sort of remediation. That testing is done, I think it's quarterly, but certainly the last test was done June 30th and all of the levels um, that indicate levels of concern for residential use, the levels that were, that were um, found in the samples taken were far, far, far below any of those residential levels. So we're aware of testing that needs to be done, we do it and the, the materials that come into the site um, our materials that our client is responsible for, has control over. It's not a site that any contractor can bring whatever it wants there. The materials are evaluated at the site before they're brought to 34 Meadow Street for further processing. That's something that we control. I don't know if that answers your question fully, but that's, um, that's the level of review, analysis, and testing that's, that, is under, that is being undertaken at 34 Meadow Street today and will continue to be for the materials that would be stored in the storage area if you deem it appropriate to grant the approvals. Excuse me, Liz. You mentioned that the material is tested or reviewed before you bring it. How, how does that happen? How do you do that? The materials, the, ag the processed aggregate is tested uh -huh. 
at 34 Meadow Street in the rock crushing facility. Though that aggregate material is analyzed and it's analyzed uh, regularly before it leaves site. But what happens when it comes to the site? Is it not dropped outside? At first it comes inside, then it goes outside? Well, Mr. Sumter, I think you're talking about how does the rock crushing facility operate, and that's already been approved. There's, there's, we're not talking about creating a new rock crushing facility. It's only the right. storage of the process. So it would be tested within the building before uh -huh. it's put outside into the, the different storage bins, as it is okay. today. All right. Um, you had a, a question about the, 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 the flood elevation on the site. I believe uh, this is in a the hundred year flood elevation at this location is 11.0. Um, and on the site plan, there is a, a line which is highlighted in red pencil on the southern portion of the property. That's the, the hundred year flood line. So there's, there's approximately 45 feet of the south end, which is below that elevation 11.0. The rest of the site is all above the hundred year flood elevation. But it, there was a question, Dean, about how the material is stored there and the height that the material had to be, rather than it sound like it didn't, it, it shouldn't be on the ground. Is it actually placed on the ground? Yes, it's or on the ground. Place? Yes, yes. Yeah, the material and, will be stockpiled on the ground. And that's allowed because it sounds like part of our reading that wasn't quite clear whether it was on the ground or it was supposed to be higher than um, the elevation, the flood there, elevation. Uh, uh, yeah, there is, there is a small portion of the site which is below the 100-year flood, as I mentioned, not the, you know, that about approximately 45 feet on the south uh -huh. end. Um, and if materials are stored there, the only addition or th there's potential for flooding in that area. We do have filtration, filtrate, filtration fabric placed along the uh, fencing, which would be up at least four feet higher to trap any sediments from going flowing in or out of our area, of our material storage area. That fil fabric fencing will be placed along the entire southern and um, eastern border of the material storage yard, but that would be a potential uh, area where sediments could be transported, but that's the reason for the filter, filter fabric fencing to prevent mm -hmm. this. And when that fabric um, is placed there, who checks it uh, over a period of time? That would be the, own, the owner, there was a maintenance, uh, there's a maintenance document and part of the maintenance document says that, you know, all stormwater uh, uh, procedures have to be maintained in proper working order. Um, including replacement of the filter fabric fence, the anti-tracking pad, et cetera. Uh, and then a new portion would be the stone infiltration trench, which we've just in installed. That will have to be maintained and inspected and maintained to make sure that it's working properly. Thank you. There was an operation and maintenance plan report submitted with the application that details all of the maintenance schedules, responsibilities, and timeline uh, that, and that just supplements what Dean was just mentioning. Thank you. At this point, if you would uh, indulge me, I'd like to have Matt Pop uh, address you and discuss the um, coastal resources, policies, and the like. Thank you. Good evening, at Matthew Pop, landscape architect, professional wetland scientist. Uh, we were responsible for preparing the uh, CAM report and the uh, planting plan. Uh, to complete that task, we visit the site uh, several times from February uh, and with the most recent of uh, being uh, today. Um, we also review plans uh, prepared by uh, Grumman Engineering, uh, Dean. And I'm not sure if I could share my screen or not. Michelle, are you able to allow him access if he doesn't? Is that, there you go. Yeah, I don't know if um. Uh, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Oh, you're all set. Okay. Okay, uh, the site uh, currently the site is a linear site, it's about 2.3 acres in size. It's following 
my cursor. I'm going to call this end of the site the northern half, and then down here, kind of the southern half. Uh, there's two uh, kind of distinct areas. The northern half right here is a kind of a large uh, level area. It's um, approximately 40 feet wide here, extended to maybe 60 to 7 feet, 70 feet wide here. It's approximately um, you know, 400 feet from this area to here, from the middle point to the northern point. Um, the southern half of the site, from here down to here, it's approximately 16 foot wide uh, asphalt driveway with millings, about 500 feet long, very narrow. There's trees growing along the sides of it. I'm going to uh, switch to a photo. I got three photos. One photo is taken at the northern end, one in the middle, looking back towards this, towards the north, and then a picture uh, from down to the southern end, looking back uh, towards the north. This is, this is a picture, of, again, from the northern end. This is the large uh, level area where the storage is going to be uh, pro proposed. There's a row of uh, existing a green giant arbor vitae just uh, on the western side of the site. Again, it's about 60 feet uh, wide where we are here. And the next photo will be taken down kind of in the middle of the site. This, this, this picture is taken at the far southern end of the site. This is that access road that's about 16 feet wide. It's uh, this area, it's mainly dirt. Uh, but when you get to the middle here, it's asphalt. Grant, I, I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm not uh, seeing. Yeah, we don't see that next photo. You can't see the photo. Let's just see. Yeah, this one's not sharing. Okay. Sharing now? Yes. Yep. All right, so again, it's taken at the far southern end of the site, looking towards the north. There's that building back here. It's approximately, you know, 900 feet from here to that building. Uh, this is about a 16 foot wide um, dirt access road and is uh, part, part of it is asphalt near the middle. Uh, there's some um, landscape debris uh, just off uh, this, just outside the picture here. Our parts of it were used for uh, lumber um, storage. This is the area that's going to be restored, this access road right through here. I'm going to go back to that area of photo. I'm just going to describe the coastal resources. And while Matt's doing that, when he means restored on that prior photo, that would be restored with plantings. It's not, yes. the road isn't going to be re reconstructed. That is the area from basically the midpoint to the southern tip of the property that would be revegetated. <clears throat> okay. So that again, that area that's being restored from here to here, it's approximately 8,500 square feet uh, that would be replanted. Uh, the coastal resources include general resources. That's any uh, land basically adjacent to Long Island Sound. Uh, there's the coastal hazard area, which Dean kind of noted on his plan was that red line that came around along here. Okay. There's tidal wetlands um, on the, uh, to the uh, east of the site. The tidal wetlands include low marsh and high marsh, very high quality. That tidal wetlands is located here uh, east of the site. Uh, on the western side of that access road right here, there's another a tidal wetland area here. The northern half of this uh, tidal wetland right here is dominated by Friday Mighties right here. And this uh, wetland drains through a culvert that's located right approximately here. A vegetation along the perimeter of the site uh, consists of uh, mainly uh, black locust. There's a few oaks, uh, cherry, there's some sumac, 
Uh, there's a lot of cottonwood growing along uh, the, this area right through here. There's also a lot of invasive non-native species, including mungwort, uh, Japanese knotweed, phragmites, um, and then again, there's some poison ivy out there too. Uh, wildlife that I observed uh, over the last uh, couple of months, again, just in the developed area, or it's used mainly by uh, suburban urban species uh, such as mockingbirds, starlings, house sparrows, song sparrows, flicker, crow, uh, blackbirds, and uh, there's quite a number of deer out at this site. There's also, and this is Village Creek here, in addition to tidal wetlands or within the tidal wetlands, there's intertidal uh, mud flats. You can see them through here. Those are where the uh, tidal wetlands were excavated in the past. Those are now mud flats. And uh, the land, the last the coastal resource is shorelands, which is the land above the coastal flood hazard area. So this area over here would be shoreland. <laughs> Uh, let, me get, let me get my to my drawing. That's the tidal wetland area uh, to the east of the site. Again, I I don't know about anyone else, but I'm not okay. seeing the picture. All right. Right, well, okay. there we go. <clears throat> okay, just go over what we're proposing. The uh, storage area again is located in this area of the site. All of the storage is proposed on existing disturbed uh, site. Um, we're proposing pavement access along this area right through here. There's a permanent anti-tracking pad located right through here. Uh, the 20 foot high uh, chain link fence is located right along here, the uh, eastern portion of the site. Uh, we're, there's the concrete block wall on the western portion back through here. Uh, there currently there are no uh, treatment of stormwater runoff from the site, uh, so we're proposing uh, catch basins, hydrodynamic separators, and underground infiltration galleries, which will help uh, treat uh, the stormwater runoff. We're proposing erosion controls during construction to uh, control any uh, sediment moving off the site. The planting plan before you consists of a row of green giant arborvitae right through here. Again, that's the same plant that you saw in that photo that was back here. Uh, that plant grows to approximately 30 feet in height. It's fast uh, growing and it's a uh, air resistant. Um, down at the southern half of the uh, site, the 8,500 square feet area here, we're proposing uh, 43 trees uh, consisting of oaks, American holly, red cedar and spruce. Uh, that area will be, uh, the disturbed area outside of the trees will be uh, seeded with a native, a salt tolerant uh, meadow mix consisting of blue stem, switchgrass and Indian grass. Um, and I think um, the last thing I wanna note about the site plan is we're not proposing any uh, site lighting. So there's, no disturbance to any non-developed area on the site. Mm -hmm. There's no disturbance to any uh, tidal wetlands. Excuse me, Matt. Yes. Could you, could you explain what is the route? Where is the paved area? And where, what is the route of the um, vehicles that right. go in and out of that site? It's right through I, here <laughs> on the northern north. Uh, Western portion of the site, right through here, they come in this way and access the site this way. And then they go back out that way. So there you will, there'll be no vehicle traffic uh, down on this uh, restored uh, wetland buffer area down here. And so what is coming. paved and what is not? Um, I think we're gonna have maybe Dean go over that, that answer that question. Uh, but, but the access way through here is paved uh, coming in. 
and what is um, planted and what has to be planted if this is approved? What is plant? Uh, well, the planting is this row of arborvitaes here, mainly uh, done for screening purposes. And then all of these plantings down here. So this entire area gets uh, replanted with uh, again, 43 trees, and then the uh, ground cover is seeded with a native uh, salt tolerant uh, meadow mix. So I would say the southern portion of the site gets planted and restored. Uh, currently, that's where that access road was taken here. That photo was taken down at, at this end looking towards the north, and we had a, a pile of uh, chopped uh, wood over here. And there's the, lots of mud. And where do you get the runoff? Where do we collect the runoff? Yeah. I'm going to have Dean answer that, I think, because I'll know where the catch basins specifically are located. But again, it would be just in this area up here is where we're doing the collection. Uh, but, can yeah. I just ask you, is the, the access road being replaced by the plantings? So okay. there's no this, longer an access yes. road? This area will just sheet flow um, off the site. Hopefully there'll be some infiltration of rainwater into uh, the ground. Um, there shouldn't be that much runoff uh, from this area, you know, because there's no water coming from, you know, anywhere, any upland area. Again, it's just this, uh, the roadway itself. Um, so again, there'll be no, um, you know, collection of stormwater runoff from this uh, portion of the site. Again, that's um, needed. Where is that access road that you showed the picture of? It, it's Before. it's that linear. It's following my cursor now, right through here. Uh -huh. Right. Again, sixteen feet wide to about here. Then it widens to like maybe forty feet here, sixty feet up here. And this road actually continues on. It goes uh, down to the south. So it will stop right here. Here's you, that culvert. Uh huh. And where's the street? The street is way up on, um, you know, it's up, Meadow Street is up off of uh, my plan. Uh -huh. Currently, there's the tidal wetland area here. There's an area right here where, uh, right here where it looks like dumpsters are stored. And then there's some buildings to the west of that. And then Wilson, you know, is up here and off the street, off the sheet to the west. Uh huh. So, so where are you uh, making those plantings? Will that eliminate that access road right there? Yes. Are the planting is actually in the road now? Yeah, the plantings are within that road uh, way. So there'll be no more uh, vehicle access through this area right here. That's going to be abandoned? That right of way? Yeah, it will be planted. I don't know if the right of way will be abandoned, but it'll be planted. And, well, if it's planted, that means you won't be able to get up in there after the planting. Is that correct? Uh, you, you would not be able to drive you know, through here once those plants are in. There's no, there's no need to drive back there. No. In the last 25 years, can you tell us how many floods have there been like in this area? Um, I could not, no. I, I can only give you anecdotal information that one of the conservation commissioners shared that was John Mulling and he had said he had not, he lives in the area, had said he is not familiar with flooding in this section of this lot, but I can't answer that question, commissioner. One thing I also did want to point out that the, if the middle dividing line of this lot where the uh, area to be planted is where Matt has the cursor right now, there's also the curbing that's there and the filter fabric. So it's another barrier for any vehicles to move further south from that line to the edge of the property all the way to the south. But mm -hmm. in answer to make it clear that that um, roadway that had existed over year that over years that had um, uh, some type of surfacing, that would be replanted. And that whole half of the lot would become revegetated and hopefully return to somewhat of a natural condition in a short period of time. Uh -huh. Liz, Liz, can you point Liz out what said, the? Oh, go ahead. Uh, could you point out what the 
um, area is that will be under the control of web construction if this is approved? The entirety of this, this uh, linear <coughs> rectangle is, would be under their control. That's what they would lease. But the only portion of it that would be developed, so to speak, is the, uh, from the middle of that, that plan to the right, to where the well, look, right I, way. I understand that. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand is, is where the cursor is being moved right now? Is it's that, that the boundary line of what's, what, what is going to be under his control? No, it's control. under the control of web construction would be all the way to the south uh, to where the cursor is now. All right, go up and down, not left and right. I'm just trying to see where, where it ends. Right here. Right there. Okay. All right. Um, Liz? Liz? Yes. I, you said, who was that that told you they weren't familiar with any flooding? Where was he when Sandy just took place? <laughs> I can't answer that, Commissioner. Okay. Um, All right. I, 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 I mean, you know, if he if he didn't um, see Sandy, he must have been on the rock somewhere. <laughs> yes, I didn't say that. There, I didn't. I wasn't oh. aware of any flooding. I just didn't know the, how often it flooded. Well, I'm only going by what the attorney just said. Oh, I say from conservation. Oh, you said you weren't aware. It was okay. just anecdotal information. Um, we, we don't have that information, but if that's something you'd like us to see if we can find, um, I guess there are ways that we could get some information, but I don't have that. I don't know how frequently it's flooded or to what extent. Uh -huh. Okay. But I think I'm just gonna maybe end with just a few uh, uh, additional comments. Um, just uh, I think it's consistent with the coastal resource use policies because again we're using an existing site right through here, right? Uh, already disturbed. Uh, we're just stockpiling uh, material on that, so it's no new disturbance. We're treating the runoff from the site, and we're restoring uh, you know about 8,500 square feet of that roadway right through here, which will improve uh, again additional for wildlife habitat. And also clean, help clean uh, the stormwater runoff. Uh, we're, we're proposing no buildings on the site, so coastal flood hazard that doesn't really come into play for buildings. Um, we're consistent with the surrounding well, land uses, which is the uh, rock crushing plant is you know, kind of right here, and you know dumpsters here, so it's somewhat consistent with that. Um, and we're avoiding adverse impacts by, again, using an existing disturbed site, uh, screening with a green giant arbor body, and we have the erosion controls that we're proposing uh, during construction. Um, so just like to complete the saying, I don't think that this project, which this is mainly just storing uh, material already on a uh, disturbed land, will have an adverse impact to the coastal resources. All of our work is proposed above the coastal jurisdiction line. There's no tidal wetlands that extend above that, and so we're not uh, disturbing any tidal wetlands. And I think that this project is uh, consistent with the uh, CAM Act. Uh, I have a question um, on the fencing. You said there was going to be a fabric liner, and that the owner of the property needed to maintain that. Is the owner HEB or is the owner the landlord who needs to maintain that fabric? Uh, web construction would be the would be obligated to maintain the fab, the filter fabric. Uh, it's the applicant, and any approvals, if you deem it appropriate to grant them, would be in the name of web construction. And the uh, um, what's it called? The excuse me, just a minute. The uh, Operation and maintenance plan report would in fact become part of any approval since it's part of the record and that uh, the requirements and obligations and schedule of maintenance would be the obligation responsibility of web construction as the applicant. Okay. And then a couple of slides ago, there was a red line and that was the above below the uh, where the flood plan would have been. And it looked like the red line crossed through the property that's going to hold some of this, some of the crushed rock or, or the or, 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 or the aggregate. And the filter fence 
was supposed to block it. Uh, is there any consideration of moving, you know, where the aggregate is stored to maybe the edge of that red line instead of having it, you know, some quote unquote safe because the red line was below and other in my mind would be unsafe because the red line crossed through the property and there could be potential flooding there. Um, I think I'll, I'll just jump in. That's an, it's an excellent suggestion. And it's certainly something that um, I would think web construction, Matt Pop and Dean Martin can consider uh, to address the concern as to where that flood line is and where material storage might be. That's an excellent question that we will definitely consider. Uh, does that end your presentation? Just a couple of other minor things. I wanted to, to advise the commission that all required CX sign-offs have been submitted, and that is fire, water pollution control, SNU, Harbor Commission, Department of Public Works, and conservation. Um, there are numerous letters of support that were submitted uh, over the past few days, and I'd like to just make sure that those are part of the permanent record. Um, and at this point, uh, we did receive some additional comments from staff this afternoon at about 10 after 4 that we have not had the opportunity to review in depth or, and we're not able to respond at this point. So if the Commission's pleasure is to uh, keep the hearing open, then if that's the case, we will certainly respond to all of those comments. We just don't have the did not have enough time to take a look at those today. But at this point, uh, I'd like to know what the Commission's pleasure is after you hear from the public as to moving this matter either ahead or continuing it or whatever your decision is. But okay, that, thank that you. concludes for now. Thank you. Uh, is there uh, anyone uh, in the public um, who would uh, like to make a uh, comment uh, at this time? Michelle, Michelle, do you show anyone with a raised hand? Okay, now you hear me. Diane um, Larchello wants to talk. She has her hand up. Okay, that's fine. Uh, All right, go Diane, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening again. Since I was on the call for the first application, I thought I'd hang around and take a look. So, um, first of all, thank you uh, for the presentation. It was quite interesting. Um, uh, I am a member of the Mayor's Water Quality Committee, although I'm not speaking on behalf of that committee tonight because we did not review this, nor did we have to. Um, but we are a subset of the Harbor Management Commission. And I did inquire of some of my friends in the Shellfish Commission and the Harbor Commission. And I do know that there has been some dialogue, and I'm very happy about that, between the applicant, Liz Suchi, and Mr. Dean Martin and others. Um, but I was told that uh, maybe due to um, technical difficulties, the uh, at least the Shellfish Commission uh, commissioner w had told me that they have not actually seen the final iteration, that the initial iteration was going to be mafia blocks, but that would not have withheld the sediment and the solubilized material. So then they spoke again. The second iteration showed a lot of improvement, but the third iteration, the final design, uh, the Shellfish Commission and the Harbor Commission, they have a permit review group called ARC. They have not actually seen the diagram. They've just been told about it due to technical difficulties. So I want to just, to, and I asked them if this would be okay, that we suggest, I suggest as a citizen who happens to have some environmental background, but I'm a citizen here, that we just add a, if you, if and when you decide to vote on this zoning commission, that you add the caveat that the final design for the sedimentation and filtration, the erosion controls must be seen by Jeff Stedman, John Pinto, Steve Bartish, who represent the Harbor Commission and the uh, Shellfish Commission. The reason the Shellfish Commission is an important stakeholder here is because many of you may not know this, but Village Creek actually contains natural shellfish beds dating back to the 1800s. And there's a map that I hope the staff has available to them. Uh, Steve, you really need that to be in your possession because it will inform you about the following thing. And that is that I do not think that a short form should have been used here. And this is not the first time I've mentioned this over the years. 
this is before both Michelle and Steve got here, is that when there's natural shellfish beds and harbor that is long form, in my opinion, should be um, utilized. But because, of course, has not that policy has not been made yet, uh, this particular applicant has been allowed to use the short form. I think that's a mistake, but um, unfortunately, it's fait accompli. Um, I did want to say that uh, the operating time for the the transport of the aggregate is very important to the people of Village Creek. Now, I used to live in Village Creek. I have a lot of friends at Village Creek, but I'm not speaking on behalf of Village Creek. But I'm a citizen in Norwalk who cares about my friends in my community. So I ask this commission to enforce making sure that the operating time of any trucks hauling in the morning or the evening, heavy trucks, that they that uh, with backup beepers that they are inhibited to their uh, use of that of the site. Uh, the, the second to last thing is, as far as the flooding goes, I really do think that's a very very important thing for this commission to know to make an informed choice. So I ask that you keep the hearing open so that some of my questions, but especially. Ms. Suchi offered, Attorney Suchi offered this, but um, I think the FEMA lines are very important here because we don't, uh, I'm hoping that the commission will ask this applicant to move any aggregate out of the flood, the 100 year floodplain because uh, flooding in a hurricane is very powerful and it can move the aggregate. And if it were to move this aggregate back into Village Creek, it could kill off the natural shellfish bed because they're very, very prone to sediment. So I think it's a very important thing. But lastly, I wanted to end with a compliment. I think there are many great improvements here of this site. I'm familiar with the site, kind of looked at it from aerial photos over the years. I think it's terrific that you're actually turning impervious surfaces of the old road into pervious surfaces, which is a higher and better use at this time. So I thank the applicant for doing that. Um, so with that, I will go and I thank you. I do think that the Shellfish Commission and the Harbor Commission should get instant referrals by the staff right up front. I'm not sure that was done here, but I hope it was. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else from the public who wishes to speak? Is that it, Michelle? That is it. No one else. Okay. Then I'd, I'd like to call on um, uh, Steve Kleppen. Uh We all received uh, that memo from him at uh, uh, late this afternoon, and we may not have had an opportunity to review it uh, carefully. Um, I, I think we, we need to put that information into the record. Sure, um, I'll go through quickly. And I, again, I apologize to Attorney Suchi and the applicant. We didn't get this late. Um, staff person who was taking the lead on this application um, is on maternity leave. Uh, so plus he got wrapped into the outdoor dining permit. So his focus was a little bit elsewhere for a while. So we had some fresh eyes that looked at this and had some different thoughts and concerns. And I'll go through with those quickly now. Um, related to the application itself, we identified a few things that we have concerns over, which I'll go through in a little more depth. Uh, the uh, first and foremost, some of these were touched on already. Um, we're a little concerned about the elevation information provided. Uh, it's a little unclear about the, where that data came from. It seems like they were some spot elevations taken and also supplemented with city GIS information, which is maybe fine, but we wanted to get that clarified exactly where that comes from. Other applications that have come in the past have used a different standard. Um, they use what's referred to as V3 and other applications we've seen come in with topographic data are T2. I am not an expert on what the difference is between the two, but that'd be something for the applicant to address uh, at a future date. Um, the, the 20 foot high fence was mentioned as a concern, uh, you know, what is the necessity of having a 20 foot high fence at the front? Is it purely for screening purposes or is there another mechanism that we could use to implement that? 
the applicant did refer their matter to uh, Connecticut Deep initially, and there were concerns, as uh, Attorney Suchi mentioned, about uh, the 20-foot the high uh, block wall at the front of the project in terms of that not being uh, consistent with their regulations. And I don't know if, you know, there's still a block wall portion at the front. I don't know how, what the difference is in terms of the sedimentation issue. It seems to me it's still the same problem, though the state looks at it a little bit uh, differently than we do. The, the chief concerns that we had, though, relate to the, um, what's occurred at the site historically. I didn't pull up, I have them available, but I didn't pull them up, were historic aerial photos. So the, the road has been there since, you know, mid-1960s. It's, it's been there for quite a while. But we think that it's gotten higher and the elevation, particularly where the site is, has gotten higher over time. Don't know exactly when and how that happened, but it, it, it appears to be that way. So this is uh, based on City GIS. This is a 2011 shot, which shows the 11-foot uh, contour, which is the kind of key contour for the site. Highlighted in green here, that is where the elevation was at 11 or, or higher. Um, in all the areas where I'm kind of pointing to now, we're, we're lower than that. Um, 2013, you can see somehow it's gotten a, quite a bit larger and expanded out. It, you know, it should be pointed out too, I imagine that the accuracy of the topographic data improved from 2007 to 2013 and is probably more accurate today. But it's still clear that this area is a lot larger from 2007. The 2016 data is pretty similar to the 2011, uh, 2013 data. And I think this next slide is pretty interesting because if you take these, if you can see these green dots on here, these are different spot elevations. There's five or six of them on there. And the text that's accompanying them shows the um, the, the height from 2007 to 2013 and 2016. Mm -hmm. And in each one of these instances, it appears that the height at that location has gone up uh, one, two feet, in some cases, three feet. And it's interesting to note several areas on here, and uh, you can see that. It's all, I'll try to zoom in a little bit if I can. Oh, no. There we go. So if you can see right where I'm kind of circling there, there are several areas. This is a 16 and this is an 18. So at what happened at different times, if I, if I turned off the topography, you'd see it. There were piles there. You know, somebody was storing dirt there for whatever reason. And it's quite possible that some of that dirt was just spread out over time and that's how you got to that increased height. So we're a little bit um, concerned that that was done uh, in the future. Um, I want to pull up another image just to show you something else that we were thinking about that might be a mitigation measure. Oh, hold on one sec. Okay, here's a, a, a broader aerial shot and this is kind of looking north-northwest, kind of probably over Village Creek. So the, the site area which the applicants went through, is, it starts on the northern end up here and terminates on the southern end down more towards Grasso. And here's that access road where the uh, Mr. Pop had indicated that they are going to replant. I, I, we think a better option would be, you know, if those areas are not using instead of replanting them is simply removing the access road altogether and I don't know if that would require uh, native replantings afterward, but that would restore the connectivity between the, the tidal area on the east side and on the west side, and would, would really, I think, environmentally would be a lot stronger. Um, I, I think that's something for the applicant, I think, to think about and the commission to think about for the next, uh, the next time we get together, if that's the direction the commission wants to go. That's kind of a brief overview of some of the thoughts that we had, and I'm happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Steve. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, the uh, commissioners? If not, I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Attorney Suchi. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to respond to a few of Ms. Laura Cella's comments and also to um, some comments that Mr. Kleppen made in the information provided today. Um, the applications that you have were, um, and any revisions to maps and plans and reports, were forwarded not only to the other SEAC agencies, such as DPW, um, WPCA, SNU, and others, but they were forwarded to the Harbor Management Commission as well, directly to John Pinto. We were before the Harbor Management Commission and its members May 5th and then again on June 25th. They saw the first plan with the 20-foot high concrete block wall and issued um, a, a memo a letter to you with respect to that initial plan. Since the plan changed, we were obligated to resend it to them because they have continuing review and um, uh, uh, jurisdiction over matters that are in, within uh, the, the harbor management uh, jurisdiction. That was again reviewed on June 25th. And just recently, since DPW decided with Dean Martin to come up with that um, um, crushed stone, uh, for lack of a better word, bed on the inside of the uh, of the concrete block that also was just was also submitted to Dr. Pinto because again any changes to the plan they're required to have a copy of and that was done. So uh, the Harbor Management Commission and its members have had have seen this not only once they've seen it twice and all sets of plans and reports have always been submitted to them as is required. Um, I appreciate Ms. Laura comments that uh, there are sh the shellfish commission is concerned about shellfish beds. Obviously, it is the shellfish beds in Village Creek near this property on the other side of property we don't own. I just wanted to make that, that comment that those beds are closed uh, and have been closed for some time. As I indicated earlier, we got the comments from staff this afternoon at uh, ten minutes after four. This application has been pending since the middle of March. I understand that there are different things that we're all encountering, whether it's COVID or staffing or whatever. But it's, it's um, a little surprising to me to receive this at, at less than two hours before the public hearing. So clearly, we're not in a position to respond to the comments raised. I will note, though, that um, I don't know what historical fill means. Is it two years, five years, 20 years? Um, my client is not the owner of this property. It had no control over what took place over the past five years or 25 years. And I hardly think that a cursory look at aerial maps that show a snapshot in time one day um, rise to the level of evidence that this is historical illegal fill. However, having said that, we will look at all the, uh, the information provided, the questions raised, and we will respond to them in kind prior to the next meeting. Uh, we don't have anything else at this point, but uh, we look forward to any other questions or comments that you or the staff may have, and we will certainly respond and get back to you and the staff accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve, uh, if we were to hold this open, uh, can we hold it open uh, for our first meeting in August? Yeah, that's that's uh, we, we'll jump ahead to the end of it. But uh, um, Attorney Suchi and I have exchanged several emails about the next meeting, and I believe she's away for the second your second scheduled meeting in August. So that could mean if it's up to you, we have the Northern application, not the Northern application, excuse me, we have the um, Glover Avenue BLT application. Uh, potentially carrying this item over, and then uh, her clients also are the Flax Hill folks. So I, I believe they may also want to go on that agenda. So it just, if you're okay, we just start at six o'clock and just barrel on through until we get done. Okay. And what is that date? August sixth, I believe. August sixth. It's a third. It'll be your regular Thursday meeting. Okay, uh, is that enough time, uh, Attorney Suchi, enough time uh, for you to prepare your response? We'll make sure it's enough time. Unfortunately, I'm away the, the meeting of August 19th and I just don't know what kind of connectivity I'll have from where I'll be. And I hate to say that I'll be available and for some reason I, I can't join in and it's unfair to you, it's unfair to staff and the applicant and other people. So the six would be fine. We'll make sure that we get to what we need to get to. Okay. Uh, Comments from the commissioners regarding um, uh, the uh, extending this until uh, the August 6th meeting? I think it's a good idea. Okay. I saw um, I support that. No problem. Yeah. Can I have a motion to that effect that we hold this uh, hearing open? Okay. I'll motion. make a motion. So I'll second. All right. Well, uh, I, I heard Frank and Nate make the motion. Okay. That's fine. Okay, so Frank made okay. the motion. Nate seconds. Okay. 
Uh, any discussion? All right. If not, all those in favor? Uh, we roll probably call. ought to do a roll. Do a roll call on this. Uh, Steve, okay. would you call the roll, please? Sure. Um, I'm just going to do it because a lot of faces on my screen. So, uh, Mr. Yeah. Shulman. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Mancini. Yes. Mr. Witherspoon. Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Okay, Mr. Goldstein? I think I have yes. more than I need, but okay. and Mr. Sumter? Yes. And Mr. Rowena? Yes. Okay. okay. Unanimous. Um, we'll uh, do our best to uh, conclude this hearing uh, on August 6th. Thank you for your time. Before we continue, anyone not speaking, can we ask you to mute? We keep picking up noise from some of you. I don't see why we can't do that. Um, and as soon as I'm finished, I'll mute uh, as well. Uh, so uh, we close this uh, hearing. 3-20 SP slash 1-20 uh, CAM and um, uh, extend it until uh, our meeting on um, August 6th. Uh, next item is action uh, on uh, items A and B. Um, item B, we've uh, just determined uh, that we're going to continue the hearing. Uh, the uh, first item uh, is um, the um, action on the city of uh, Norwalk, um, uh, the uh, elementary uh, elementary school, Jefferson School. Um, is there a motion to uh, approve uh, the request? Uh, Nate, Nate, I, Nate, I, Nate, 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 but you're muted. Nate, you're muted. I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay, Galen okay. made the motion. Nate, did you I'll, second? I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, <laughs> am, I un, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, discussion okay. uh, regarding the project? All right, if not, uh, we'll call the question. Let's uh, uh, again do this um, uh, by uh, polling the members, Steve. This, this, yeah, I just want to make sure I got all the seated okay, members and first. This is a motion to um, uh, approve uh, the Jefferson School project, allow it to go forward, uh, and uh, in addition uh, to not require a traffic report. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to flag the regular members so I don't get everybody that's not, not eligible to vote. Um, Mr. Shulman? Yes. Mr. Witherspoon? Yes. Mr. Sumter? Yes. Ms. Wells? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Johnson? I'm a thumbs up for a yes. I see you're muted. Uh, okay. And Mr. Rowena? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, good. Um, let's move on. Uh, item uh, B, Clay, Connecticut, LLC, 8589 Water Street, uh, 29,000 square foot multi-activity entertainment. Complex. You may remember that uh, uh, we um, a very similar project at the same location. This is now uh, apparently a different um, uh, uh, owner uh, of a different company uh, that wants to do something which is um, very, very similar to what we had uh, previously approved. Um, Attorney Suchi, are you representing? I am here. Okay. Here. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission for the Record. I'm Lynn Suchi, a partner at Carmody Torrance Sandak and Hennessy. I represent the owner, which is uh, District 
Sono LLC and Sono Square Associates. Uh, the proposal before you is almost identical to that which you approved last year. The difference being there would be a new operator, not a new owner of the, the property, but a new operator. Uh, but just to take a step back, um, and with me this evening is Chris, Chris McCag, who's project architect, Neil, um, excuse me, Neil Linsky, our traffic engineer, and Manny Silva is the project, en um, the civil engineer, in case you have questions for them. The property is the old, the building where Lillian August is situated in Sono Bakery. And in the back, it used to be also um, the Barteca Group on the main and the second floor. It is in the South Norwalk Station Design District within the CAM zone. It's just over about two acres in size. There's also a separate offsite parking lot across the street um, on Water Street where um, um, the Sono Seafood Restaurant is. And then there's an additional offsite parking lot on Day Street. Those two lots provide the parking resource for this structure. Uh, current uses are warehouse, office, some storage, uh, some manufacturing, and some retail including, as I said before, Sono Baking, West Marine, and former, formerly Lillian August. In January of 2019, you approved a concept for an entertainment venue by Play CT LLC, which was about 30,000 square feet, a variety of entertainment uses, such as there was bocce and bowling and escape rooms and billiards and interior food trucks, bars, restaurants, and things of that nature. A zoning permit was issued in April, but a building permit was not issued. Uh, that entity um, did not move forward with the building permit, and in December of this past year, if you recall, you granted an extension of time for a building permit to be issued to protect the underlying approvals. So what's before you this evening is generally the same concept, an entertainment venue for families. There are some slight changes, some slight reductions in square footage. It's now about 28,000 square feet rather than just about 30. Now it's axe throwing and golf simulators and an on-site brewery, uh, an outdoor food truck, um, a more open kitchen restaurant concept. There's also a space dedicated for uh, events called Sparkalicious. In addition to that, there is also a proposal for a fencing uh, school where individuals can learn foil and saber and epe. Um, no competitions, but a fencing school nonetheless, much like you would have a karate school or something similar to that. Um, I, we, we've proposed this as a modification to the underlying approval. There are very limited um, exterior changes, but Chris McCagg can certainly walk you through them if you would like to have some more information about them. But basically an entertainment center that was approved, approved is being modified to provide different uses, some <laughs> dif different programmatic space with a different uh, new operator who has much experience in this area with uh, venues it operates in New York State. Um, so far, we have, uh, I think we have SNU, fire, and traffic mobility and parking sign-offs are in. We received some comments today from DPW. Uh, we may have WPCA, but in any event, all of those respective SEAC agencies have been notified of the application, uh, including redevelopment. We're working with all of them to address their concerns, and we hope that you would view this as a minor change to the underlying approval. At this point, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like Chris McCagg just to give you an idea of some the floor plans, some changes to the exterior, but I think it's rather self-explanatory. Uh, before he begins, I, uh, someone else had made this comment. I certainly would never make the comment, but I, I, I think it's worth repeating. And that is just to question whether it's a good idea to mix alcohol and ax throwing. <laughs> oh, it, it's, that's a funny, it's funny that you should say that, but that is a very popular uh, concept. And the Department of State of Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection Liquor Division has seen these types of, of uh, venues very frequently. I thought, Mr. Shulman, you were going to say, please don't combine the words adult and entertainment in the same sentence. And I've been trying my best to avoid that. <laughs> so may I turn it over to Chris? Please. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chris McCagg, uh, Rogers McCagg Architects. We've uh, been part of the South Norwalk community here in Norwalk since 2001. We've uh, done plenty of projects in this town and the surrounding towns and uh, are uh, happy to be part of this project. I won't take much of your time. I'll go through this quickly. Um, the first image is just a Google Earth uh, to follow up on what Liz was saying in terms of the site. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The old Lily in August and Sonoma Bakery property. 
the area of the building we're talking about is on the upper end uh, where the old building in August was and some of the surrounding office uh, space. Um, and then that alternative, the alternative parking lots are across the street on either side on Day Street and across Water Street. Um, and you can see that in, uh, in some of the following images as well. I'm gonna switch images here. <clears throat> Bear with me. So this is just, a, again, an orientation plan and then the property plan showing uh, the property and the orientation of the site. Uh, all this was filed with you. Uh, this is the Day Street property parking, which is part of the proposed plan. Um, the hatched area is the portion of the building um, that we're focusing on, uh, which is the district Sono. So you, uh, the new corner entry will be reconfigured and enlarged to meet egress code and uh, appropriate access, so on and so forth. There'll be open dining and restaurant, uh, a central bar, an arcade space, uh, sit golf simulators, the axe throwing stalls, uh, a brewery that will be vis visible, um, but not open to the public, but visible to the patrons uh, for, uh, for uh, brewing. And then really the, the almost, I'll say the last third of the space is really back of the house for the prep kitchen, restrooms, uh, the lobby, the adjacent office space um, that will require some renovation work due to the new programming of the uh, District Sono space. And then the adjacent Sparkalicious, which is a uh, works in conjunc conjunction, but separately with District Sono, and then the fencing venue that uh, Liz had mentioned as well. What, uh, what is, I, 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 I couldn't find, and maybe it's just me, what is Sparkalicious? Sparkalicious is really a, uh, a, a venue, a kind of a craft venue for really children. Uh, you know, a, a bunch, you can have a birthday party there for uh, your, your uh, young daughter, her and her friends go there, they build jewelry. Um, that kind of thing. So it's 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 like a craft uh, art artsy kind of craftsy uh, venue. That the idea is is that when um, you you have the option when when the district Sono venue is closed, this Sparkleless just kind of opera can is independent and can operate on its own. But when both are open, you can. Uh, communicate between the two spaces. So if you're, you know, an adult, two families meeting here, the adults can hang out in the adult area and the children might go and do some kind of craft project in the Sparkalicious space. And that, so, is, that is a permitted use um, at a uh, venue that serves uh, alcohol? Yes. Hmm. Um, if I may just interrupt for a second, uh, sure. there will have to be a, um, uh, applications to the State Department of uh, Consumer Protection Liquor Division, and they typically evaluate, as is required, the site plan to make sure of questions just as yours, Mr. Shulman, that minors don't enter into areas that they're not supposed to be in. But that floor plan that you see, uh, either this or an iteration of it, would be reviewed by liquor control as part of the application for liquor permit for whatever type of liquor permit is sought for the premises. Thank you. Uh, actually, here's a better, you know, a more, a, a slightly more detailed plan, but it, it's uh, essentially what I just described. And as Liz mentioned, it is uh, slightly smaller in square footage from the previous submittal uh, submission a, a year or so ago. Excuse me, I'm not sure how you're going to have axe throwing and children involved in the same building. And you're going to have to convince me that this is a minor change with axe throwing in a building like this. I don't, I don't see it. So um, maybe you can explain to me. I've never seen um, anyone throw axe inside. I've seen it outside, but never inside of a building. 
So, I, talk to me. Well, I don't know, Liz, do you want to speak to that or? I'll, I'll take a first stab at it and then Chris, you can <laughs> correct me as I go astray. Um, any of the areas where the ax throwing is, it's kind of like darts, but of course they're axes, but they're separated out and, and um, it, it's not an area that they're just right in the middle and, and they just go nuts throwing axes at, at willy nilly. It, there's, it's a defined area, it's controlled. Um, and Chris, maybe you can describe better how, how it functions, what the walls are, how, they, how individuals get in and out. But it's become a very, very popular uh, addition to um, entertainment venues. And it is, um, all sorts of controls are required for the obvious reasons. But Chris, maybe you could be more specific than I? Yeah, not, I mean, honestly, not much more, but other than to say that it is regulated and that there are actually acts throwing leads now. If you YouTube this activity, there are multiple, multiple venues that are indoor in conjunction with bars. It's, a, it's, it's the latest craze in, a, you know, forgive me, as Liz said, adult entertainment. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it, there are regulation court sizes. Um, basically, there's a, you can see it here, the, the thin line. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. I guess maybe. Um, so so these are the on. courts. So, so these courts are roughly eight feet wide by about 25 feet long. There's a throwing line. There, there are, there is a, you know, a person watching, kind of a designated person, safety person, kind of watching everything. And you go up to this line. It's one person at a time. Uh, and there's basically a bullseye on the opposite wall, and you're throwing. Uh, an axe, and each one of these stalls are contained. There's, you know, they're 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 done in many different ways. In their simplest form, it's wood framing with chicken wire, uh, and and um, you know everyone kind of hangs out and watches and, and enjoys themselves. You don't, you're, no one's allowed to walk onto the into this area. The line that you throw from, and all the viewing happens behind it. So the actual throwing of the ax is contained, except for the person going to take it out of the, out of the board. I, I just want to hop in. I know that there's a, there is an ax throwing, I believe there's an ax throwing place up in New Haven or something in that, in that area. I guess my question would be, um, and I guess maybe to just zone in on where Nate is going. Yeah. And I assume this is a formality, but just go with me here. Uh -huh. There is a kids are not going to be allowed to just wander in the axe throwing place. I think it's uh -huh. a broader concern here. Okay, that's what I thought. Well, and have you been to anywhere axe? where they throw the axe and they have children there? Period. I mean, to me, I don't see this sparklicious and axe throwing in the same place. I just I'm not. No, they they actually the kids can actually throw the axes. So the answer to that is yes. <laughs> this gets better and better. What and could also, possibly also, go wrong with axe throwing liquor and children all in the same venue? Uh, I, I, we, I we can, we just, can show you examples if that would help. It, you said you have, Chris, you have examples? We can show, I mean, you know, not, not, uh, examples that my firm has done personally, but as I said, you know, we can, we can show you s samples of venues that have all of this. Why don't you both, why don't you both show us uh, uh, the samples and if there is uh, a facility similar to this uh, that's not too far away, if you could provide that address to us so that those of us um, um, who want to see what it looks like and can take a ride over. Sure, absolutely. If I may just add, um, I, I don't want it to appear, and I thought Chris was clear on this, that the area where the eight rows or the eight lanes for axe throwing is taking place is just an open area and it's, it's visible from Sparkalicious and you can enter. If you see right where Chris is drawing the line, that red line, um, th to the right of where it says coat rack, there's a wall. There's an overhead door to get into Sparkalicious. So it's, it's not as if the uh, youngsters or whoever's using that space could just meander into any of these lanes. 
Um, and there are dividers with each of the lanes. So there are restrictions, there are requirements, and there are separations between the various uses, particularly Sparkalicious and the axe throwing. Just as there are um, behind it, there are the boilers are on the bottom of the, the sheet, uh, the bottom of the, the, of the page that you see. So it's not an open area where one would think, yeah, if people are oh, throwing axes and their kids running around, there are dividing areas and divide, demising walls to separate out the different uses. I don't know if that was clear from either my presentation or Chris's or the plan. No, but, but we also heard it said that children would be permitted, un unless we misunderstood, the children would be able to throw axes. No, all, all I was saying, just to clarify, is that in other venues, if you research this activity in sport, it's not limited to adults. They actually have young children, not, you know, infants, but <laughs> younger children participate in this activity. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that the owners are proposing that. I, I'm, I'm, I was trying to help familiarize the group with the activity. I'm wondering if this is a minor change. Well, Mr. if I may address that, Mr. Sumter, if the axe throwing component is as significant as you say, it's not, it's a small portion of 30,000 30, square feet. If, if you would, I would like um, John Greenspan, of uh, representative of the owner, if he could join in because he has the, the best information on how this functions and he could answer the questions that perhaps you have better than Chris or I. Could we possibly get John in as a participant? Uh, sure, I'm right here. If, if yep. um, uh, John Greenspan with David Adam Realty, uh, affiliate of the ownership of the building. When we brought the new operator in, Diamond Properties, and, and they, and they um, talked about their mix of uses, they the key to the mix of uses is different times of the day. Um, so, you know, daytime, the arcade and Sparkalicious being extremely busy, mostly families, and obviously nighttime Sparkalicious will be closed and um, you know, more bar activities, ax throwing, that type of thing. So we definitely see different, different users at different times of the day. Um, the intent is ax throwing will be adult activity. Um, uh, Diamond Properties, they run several different, many venues and you know, they're very experienced in uh, you know, oversight of, of the different activities. So it's, yeah, I think prim primarily this, to look at this, it's a, it's a brewery and arcade with Sparkalicious. The ax throwing is an ancillary activity that um, will be, um, you know, operating at, at certain times. Well, John, can you tell us where is this done? And somewhere close where, because this is something I'd like to just take a look at before I can vote on anything. Maybe my one vote won't matter, but I've never, it's a, it's a, it's something I've never seen. Let me put it like that. Right. And, yeah, there are many venues around New Haven's one. I believe there may be one Stanford have to confirm that. Um, but yeah, think of it as dart. The best way to think about it is darts and their lanes that are all protected lane to lane. So um, you, you want me to think of acts as darts? <laughs> yes, with as a yes. as a tossing of a tossing of the of the uh, axe and then each each of those lanes are separated with with wood and wall so you're not going to have an ability to they're self-contained but i do understand okay. i i hear you john but i don't think of axe as darts not where i come from anyhow maybe in your neighborhood they're the same <laughs> thing <laughs> uh, steve i have a question for you and that is if we were to approve this um uh can we um uh, say that um the uh axe throwing would be limited to persons uh uh 21 and above or 18 and above that's a little tricky because i don't know how they op operate the space. I think we need to get a little more information from the applicant on who's actually using the entire facility and, and how that's handled. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if how comfortable I am with that kind of um, com, uh, condition on an application. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for us to enforce that. I mean, I don't, 
you know, we don't have the ability to go in and check IDs and that kind of thing. Um, ex excuse me, Mr. Solon, Mr. Sumter, it's Chris McCag. Um, I, I believe there's an ax throwing facility in Bridgeport. Yeah, so, about this. Um, we will let, let me clarify that and forward you all the information. And uh, I think that's something potentially close enough to go and look at. Yeah, this is, is Manny Silva, the civil engineer. Hi, this is, is Manny Silva. Um, Chris, other Sorry? than Bridgeport, I'm just wondering. Sorry. I don't know if I want to go to Bridgeport to watch people throw axes either. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can, uh, you know, while you guys were talking, I just yeah. Googled indoor axe throwing and they up pops about 30 different images of different styles of courts and exactly. you know, some are, some are some are uh, chain link fenced off between the areas. There's ones that show uh, complete enclosures in wood. So it, it's kind of, uh, you know, assuming there's something similar, it's not like something, someone's just gonna run up and run in between the thrower and the ax. I mean, that's, you know, that's, it's, it's not, you can only access it from one point. Yeah. Excuse me, but in this day and age of COVID, would these places be open for us to go see? I, you know, I sort of doubt that. Is X throwing <laughs> the uh, things that are opening up in what which phase? I'm. Can I, I would just like to note. I would say a definitely about younger adults. This is a thing. Uh, this is a popular thing that happens. Um, and I, from what I know, I know there are places in Connecticut. I don't know if any of you have done research into those places and how well they've done, or if they've had safety incidents or anything like that. I don't know. But this is, Nate, this is a thing that exists. And I know okay. that I have been invited to do this before, socially okay. myself. If I may join in, my daughter took my son to an ax throwing place in Brooklyn. And my daughter's 27, my son is 20, and they had a great time. Now, whether or not there's an older population, this being an older population, I don't even think I would be attracted to ax throwing, but it might depend upon the day. But I think uh, Commissioner Goldstein's correct. It's, it's a very popular uh, activity that's gaining popularity in this section of, of Connecticut, um, just by virtue of the, the sheer number of different op opportunities out there. We'll get you, a, how about if we get a variety of links to different sites that if you can, you can go see, and if I can find out if what their status is vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID, we'll let you know that as well. How's that? Okay, thank let you. I mean, I guess the, the only other concern, I guess, would be potential safety issues, but that's something I think we can work out later. Let's continue with the presentation. Yeah. Okay, so that, that is the, uh, the general plan. Uh, the uses as, as uh, you know, all of this was obviously submitted with the package, but all of the various uses of the space that all comply and tied to the parking requirements, et cetera. Um, uh, I should back up quickly. The one difference and change that we're proposing to the, uh, compared to the last submission is the addition of the food truck on the outside and reconfiguring of some parking, owner parking that is, on, along Elizabeth Street. Uh, these, these spots are uh, on the owner property and some of the comments that we uh, received back was just to make sure that whatever we're proposing is within the property line. So what we're proposing is a small grass area um, and a, and a spot designated for the food truck. So the, I, the concept here is that they have kind of supplemental guest food truck, you know, like ax throwing, a, a big thing in the young adult uh, kind of socializing and uh, social media is following these gourmet food trucks around. They all have followings. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting about the new owners of this venue is that they're they're kind of a, uh, a conglomerate of, of restaurateurs and uh, recreational facilities like this and and they're very interested in creating and attracting um, you know the younger crowds and, and providing something that that they're interested in and, and that's unique and the, this whole food truck uh, experience was one of those. Initially, we were trying to incorporate the, the, 
mobile food truck inside, but that didn't work out so well with a lot of the code requirements. That um, truck and the, the three tables you're showing, uh, that is um, uh, vertical parking during uh, the day, is it not? Uh, currently, yes. Yeah, that's all, that's angle park. So Correct. that represents a loss of uh, quite a few parking spaces. Right, but it, it correct, but their owner, their owner, their own parking spaces. They're not town parking spaces. Oh, okay, okay. And in, in addition, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Shulman, uh, the total amount of parking required for the proposed use with all the changes is less than the amount of parking that was required for Play CT, and. Um, I, I just remind you that we have a 70 or so, I think it's 70 or so spaces on Water Street, and another 52 on Day Street. But the total number now has, has come down by about 20. So the loss of those spaces uh, during the time when the food truck will be there and some outdoor tables will be there um, is offset by the excess that we have now by virtue of the, the small number of spaces required for the uses proposed. However, those spaces um, also meet the needs of the greater South Norwalk area. So it is a, um, a, a true reduction in available parking in uh, South Norwalk, you know, if not for this facility. And I, I, mean, I understand the, the desire to activate the, the, uh, uh, the streetscape. Um, I, think, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I just feel a little bit of discomfort uh, losing parking spaces in South Norwalk. Well, uh, not, there will be a, a 52 space lot on Day Street, which right now is is just an, an open lot. It's not it's not lined. It's not um, it's not uh, properly um, um, finished. It's it's just a um, space. So that that resource will become available and it, it'll be a great resource rather than just an open lot that ha that has has no rhyme or reason, no drainage, no lighting, no it's it's a really valuable asset, I think, as proposed compared to the spaces that would be lost for the food truck and a few tables. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. Would the food truck be there permanently? No. So how does that work? Well, I, uh, my understanding or the intention of the owner is that they would have, um, I'll call it guest food trucks on some kind of schedule. I don't know if it's weekly. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe John can elaborate on that. I'm not sure of the exact schedule, but it would be a, it would be a rotation of different vendors. Also, the, those picnic tables that's there. They're not going to be moving them every. No. I mean, how's that going to work? And as as the um, chair indicated, those spaces are valuable spaces for parking in South Norwalk, and having that food truck there, and then taking up those spaces. Well, How do you think that's I, I think as, as Liz said, I, I think there's a, a, a very valuable piece of property that the owner has now that is sitting vacant basically that's going to be converted to 52 parking spaces. That's not on Elizabeth Street. No, it's right around the corner though. And those, yeah, those well, spaces- the, the food truck is gonna be taking up, these spaces here, in my opinion, are more valuable than the one that's in that empty lot that's away somewhere else. I mean, I live in this area, so I know that those spaces are quite valuable have, where they are. The As lot the, is right here. Yeah, that's not on Elizabeth Street. Yeah, that's right. But uh, Mr. Are there any, will, will there be any restrictions uh, in, on that lot? Can they be used by um, local residents or will be limited uh, just to this facility? I, I don't think that my client is, is interested in, in putting up a gate or anything of that nature. They would be used in conjunction with the uses that are proposed for the site itself. But just to go back to the parking spaces on Elizabeth Street, 
Um, right. Most of those parking space, a good portion of them are on private property. They're not all. Yeah, they all are. Just, you know, they're, they're on private property. And while I understand your concern about losing available spaces on street in South Norwalk, personally, I think it, it's more beneficial to have a parking lot across the street from this, from this building that's, that's paved, that's lined, that has lighting, that has great access to it and is in a, in, a, in a lot that you can, you can better use and would be in a piece of land that would be better utilized than these funny angled spaces on Elizabeth Street that are on private property to be taken up by a few tables and a food truck, which would activate the street. I think, in my opinion, I, I believe that there, you would have a lot of residents coming to the facility, trying to get, uh, getting food from the food truck. And if they're drive, first of all, if they're in the neighborhood, they'd be walking, I would think. But if they're driving, I think it'd be more beneficial and more um, um, palatable and for them to come to the lot on Day Street rather than try to, to get into those oddly angled spaces on Elizabeth Street. It's a, it's a better opportunity and it's right across the street. But that's, you know, we can, we can differ on that, Mr. Sumter. And, and can you just remind me, I don't have it handy, how many of the required spaces will the Day Street lot accommodate? I believe it's 52. 52, yeah. 52. But I mean, how many are required for the facility? Oh. Well, the, the facility is a non-conforming use, so we have to deal with that. There are also um, mixed use credits that, are, that, have, that apply to this, to, this, um, to this use. But the num number of spaces, Chris, what are the total number of spaces that are required? I just don't remember offhand. Was it like 90 or more than that? 92 or 96. 96. Okay. Oh. 92, whatever the number is. No, it's 96, right? So the day street line. 92.22. Handles half of that flow. And then I, I think I recall you're relying on the shared parking across Water Street. Water Street is also owned by our clients. So it's okay. directly, uh, directly used and it's a resource directly for this site. And that has how many spaces? Sorry, I just don't have it in front of me. Is that 72 or 75? I still remember the number offhand. 74 spaces. 74? Plus, plus the additional spaces that Sona Seafood controls. It's another 40 or so. Uh, one, right. one quick comment uh, to address Commissioner Sumter's questions on the spaces on Elizabeth. Uh, right. This plan doesn't show the new spaces that were created by the Day Street improvements, the parallel parking spaces along Day in the back. That added about at least six or eight spaces of on-street parking when they created the one-way Day Street. So uh, mitigate some of those spaces taken for, um, the three spaces taken for the uh, um, uh, benches. Uh, I had uh, uh, another, um, a question about the, the front of the building on water. Uh, there is a planted area. Uh, was that also going to be used for tables? No. No, that it, it was in the previous submission for play, uh, but is not in this venue. Okay. The only, the only impact to Water Street really is the introduction of the handicap access ramp up to the new entry in this corner. So the, the bed, as much as we can retain it, the intention is to keep all of that. Okay. Any other questions from um, commissioners? I, yeah, where are we going axe throwing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, are the, I know the Day Street lot would be repaved. What about the other lot, the Water Street lot? There, there are no plans at this point, as far as I know, for my client to resurface that. It's in pretty good condition. Um, but I don't, ha I have not been advised that they plan to, uh, to repave it or restripe it. Um, I, I think it functions perfectly fine as it is right now. Uh, but I'll ask the question of them, Mr. Sumter. Uh, yes, I'd like to know that simply because, again, I'm in that area frequently and I use those lots. And I, I don't use the Day Street lot simply because um, you can't get in there now. And, but the Water Street 
lot. I'm wondering because I don't think that one is in the best of condition. And if you're going to have a new venue and you're going to have people park there, I'm not even certain how well it's um, lined. And I'm wondering what's the plan, John? Yeah, we, we agree with you, Commissioner Sumter. We have a plan with the expect, especially the monument signage there, which is falling over. And when Lillian left as part of the, the new plan uh, to, to do some improvements there to, to make it in keeping with what we're, what we're trying to do here at the property. We can't Thank control the, far, the piece in the back with Sono, um, Sono Seafood, but yeah. We'll, Thank we'll, you, John. We'll, uh, thank you. How about the brewery? Isn't that a new addition? That is one of, uh, Commissioner Witherspoon, that is one of the new additions, new programmatic space that didn't exist with Play CT, but that would be a brewery for um, consumption within, not for brewery, and then distribu distributing it into the, um, the chain of products in the marketplace. Uh, and it wouldn't be a brewery where people go in and, and look around and, and they, they would manufacture beer there for it to be consumed on the premises. Okay. Do we have any other questions? If not, um, uh, is there someone um, willing to make a motion on this or is it your preference uh, uh, to hold off and until we've had an opportunity to research this ax throwing a little further. It's my preference to hold off and research the ax throwing. And particularly, like I said, in the same, not in the same, um, in the same space, so to speak, as with the children and the sparkalicious and all that. I'd like to personally just research it a little bit prior to, I'm. I'm for businesses in South Norwalk. I think it's a good idea, but this um, this is a little bit different than the last application. And um, you know, you had bocce and pool things that I'm familiar with, and this is a little different. I'd like to do a little research personally. Just to piggyback on what Nate said, I think maybe something that would be uh, helpful to provide to us, Counselor, would be maybe uh, an outline of the hours of operation for both the children facilities as well as the ax throwing, you know, the bar and brewery, I'm forgetting the name of it, I apologize. Um, and maybe if there are precautions that are in industry standard that are put in place to ensure that if you have such an ax throwing facility or, or a place where danger, more dangerous adult activity could happen and there are kids in proximity, like what you do about that. Um, so maybe some informational uh, uh, resources here may be helpful for us. Um, commissioners, um, I have a list of things that you've thrown out with respect to this one small aspect of the total. And you'd like to know where the venues um, provide, some, provide their website. Are you able to go to see them due to COVID? What kind of safety requirements? Um, how does liquor fit in? What are their configurations? So that plus the other comments you just raised about uh, hours of operation or, or how they handle individuals who are participating in this activity, I'm sure we can get that to you. I'd like to think once you have that and once you've been able to visit a location and perhaps talk to the operators if you're, when and if you're there, that you could move this for action on, at your next meeting. Um, I, I, everything else remains virtually the same. This is one of the only more unusual and new components that you haven't seen. But if those are the items that you're looking for, I'm sure between Chris, myself, and Mr. Greenspan, we can get you that information. Okay. Well, now, if you expect us to, unless I know where these venues are, because one of my concerns is with axe throwing is safety. And I know I'm a veteran and I've seen firing lines where people are firing while somebody's down there moving targets and things like that. And that's really what my concern is. Are they picking? How, how is the um, ax being retrieved? Things like that, that um, makes sense to me, particularly when you're in an area where you have a brewery. I've seen stuff happen at breweries when they don't throw ax. So I'm just... <laughs> Okay. Right. It sounds as if we can we can um, uh, 
through um, uh, our own research and uh, uh, research from uh, uh, Liz and her associates, uh, we should be, get, be able to get answers to that. Why don't we place it on, also on the agenda uh, for uh, August 6th? Steve, can we manage that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we will focus, we'll do our best to just focus on that one issue. Um, so that we can um, um, reach a final decision. Uh, I think that's uh, fair. I agree. Okay. Uh, everybody else uh, comfortable with that? Yes. 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 I'm comfortable. Okay. Yes. I'm comfortable. Okay, Steve. We need to do a roll call on this, or is that sufficient? No, that's you're just continuing the item. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next item on our agenda uh, is a review and action on new applications. Uh, we have an application 5-20 SP Workforce Partners LLC, 204 Flax Hill Road, uh, proposed historic preservation development. Um, is there who is sorry you're stuck with me again sorry oh, yes. <laughs> again for the record Liz Suchi of Carmody Torrance and I represent the applicant 204 Flax Hill LLC with me this evening is Mark Hopper of Krosky Architects he is the project architect Chris DeAngelis of Cabezas DeAngelis he is the civil engineer and Kevney Moses he is a principal of 204 Flax Hill for the record, I'd like to let you know that neighbors were notified of the submission of the application on July 2nd via certificate of mailing, and a copy of that certificate of mailing was uh, sent to staff, um, I think, the next day. The project uh, before you is for the property at 204 Flax Hill Road, and if someone could possibly call up um, a site plan or a survey for me, that would be great. But in the meantime, it is in District 2, Block 48, Lot 44. It is at the intersection of Taylor Avenue generally and Flax Hill Road if you haven't had the opportunity to visit the site. The property is in the D resident zone. It's bounded on the northwest by Flax Hill Road, on the east or on the right of the, the screen by State of Connecticut land, and on the north and the south by other um, uh, multifamily residential developments. Um, you'd like to probably wondering who is Workforce Partners and 204 Flax Hill LLC. Well, Workforce Partners is an owner operator of workforce housing units that provide affordable units to citizens who earn 60 to 100% of the average area median income. Workforce buys, rejuvenates, modernizes, and makes efficient uh, class B or C housing and then offers them at affordable rates. It creates communities that are healthy, safe, environmentally friendly, discounted rents to various everyday heroes, including teachers, firefighters, police, EMTs, municipal employees, and others. Um, other locations that a workforce housing currently has in, in Norwalk are on Connecticut Avenue, South Main Street, and another one on Flax Hill. So back to the site and the project. As I indicated before, this is property that's on um, 204 Flax Hill. Right now, there are four structures that exist on the property. There is a, the site front building that has kind of a rounded front that um, uh, Mark is circling. That's called the Ferris Mansion. That was constructed around 1890. It was the home of John Ferris, who was a state legislator and state senator. He was a local merchant and is one of the founding families in Norwalk. It's about 7,500 square feet and has six units in it today. Uh, next, to the, next to that building, there is a large, longer building um, called the, excuse me, it was constructed around 1969. Uh, it's got other, many other dwelling units in it. Then there is the carriage house, which is on the, southern, the southerly side of the, the property, which we're circling right now. Uh, that has about four units. That was constructed around 1900. And then there is a larger building in the back, um, it's constructed around 1969, and that has about 18 units. Tur currently on the property, there are 36 dwelling units, and they're all in that affordable range of um, the state of the average area median income as opposed to the state median income. 
rents are about $1,500 a month or about 76% of Norwalk's average median income. What we plan to do, what my client plans to do is twofold. First off, it is we would like to take the existing Ferris building at the front of the property that has six units and rehabilitate and restore that historic structure to close to what it looked like when it was constructed in the late 1800s. One of the things to be added to it would be a wraparound porch, which is reminiscent of the architecture of the time, and to restore a similar dome to the structure that had existed prior to a fire um, in the, I guess it was the 70s, in which the dome was removed. Uh, that would remain six units. It would um, have other architectural features added to it, and I'll leave the, that to Mark in just a minute to describe to you. The other component part is to remove the carriage house on the southerly side of the property, which I said before has about has four units, and to replace that structure with a 14-unit new dwelling. So overall, the total number of units would go from 36 existing to a total of 46. Uh, five of the units on the site would be deed restricted, deed restricted in accordance with your workforce housing regulations. But as I said before, the, the other units on this site provide another housing product for a segment of the population that finds market rate housing uh, out, perhaps out of reach and may not qualify for the deed restricted workforce housing under the uh, 830G requirements. Um, the other, the reason that a special permit application is before you is because there are a variety of height and bulk requirements that we are unable to meet. So your regulations were amended to allow for what we call exceedances of those height and bulk requirements, provided certain other component parts are met, that the, the lot is a minimum size, the structure to be rehabilitated is either on a local state or national registry, that we do the least, the, the most minimal work, but we, but we dedicate that work to uh, restoring the structure. And in connection with this project, there are three areas in which uh, exceedances or relief from the regulations through Section 118.360b2y uh, is being sought. One relates to residential density. Permitted in this zone is 1,650 1, square feet per dwelling unit and we are providing 1,348, so there is an increase in residential density. There is a request for relief from some, for some of the parking spaces that don't quite measure eight and a half feet by 19 feet in depth, and those are existing stalls, generally in the middle of the site. And the last request, um, which has come up by virtue of some further review by the zoning enforcement officer, that um, in connection with the creation of the wraparound porch at the Ferris building at the front of the park property, the front setback for parking cannot be met at 50 feet. It is reduced to 37 and a half feet for the four parking spaces at the front of the site. So that's the general overview of the project. Um, had we not had an increase in the slight increase in residential density and had the parking spaces met the requirements and had the, the porch been able to be constructed so we didn't impact that 50 foot setback, this would like, like, likely not need to be before you but a special permit is necessary for those various exceedances. Um, plans and reports have been submitted and that's traffic report, landscaping plans, uh, lighting plans, um, full architectural plans and floor plans. But at this point, if you would, wouldn't mind, and I know the hour is getting late, I would like um, Mark Hopper to describe to you the plan renovations for the Ferris House and to, to go into a little bit of detail on what the proposed new 14 unit structure is uh, that will rep replace the carriage house. So at this point, if Mark could come on um, and I'll let him go through those concepts with you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for the record, my name is Mark Hopper. I'm the principal at Krosky Architects. Um, we utilize the, uh, this uh, um, change to your zone on three, the three Elmcrest project. Um, I had minimal experience with that project. I presented the project before this uh, group when it, when it went through its approval process. So here you uh, are, it's kind of a, a glimpse of, of where we're headed with the, um, with the Ferris Mansion. We, um, when, we, when we began to look at this project, we kind of referred to the um, Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. And there's really kind of four um, um, procedures that you kind of follow, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. Well, as you can see from the original mansion to the current mansion, we lost a lot of the character defining uh, elements with that fire. 
So we really found ourselves in a, in a reconstruction procedure. So once we started to go that, down that, that road, we began to look at the building, analyze it a little bit, and, and we really kind of focused on uh, three areas that we felt would provide the, the um, greatest visual impact, impact on the existing building. And that was really the reconstruction of uh, the gables, gable ends on the south and west side of the buildings. So you can see in the original building was a gable end here and a gable end there, which is now missing in the current mansion in this location and that location. In our proposal, we um, reconstruct the two gables, um, again, on the south and the, uh, and the west. The second area of uh, um, you know, great visual impact was rebuilding the uh, the roof and reconstructing the roof um, over the uh, over the corner tower, and the third element was really the wraparound porch. You can kind of see this nice wraparound porch across the front around the corner turret, and then uh, extending along to what was once a a, a port cochere in the original mansion, is to really kind of emulate and and reconstruct that that porch, and it essentially functions very nicely in that the porch leads to um, uh, one of the ground floor units that faces Flax Hill, but then off to the side, uh, the, the porch extends around and, and uh, covers the entrance into the main center stair of the building that connects to the other five, uh, other five units um, within, the, uh, within the building. Um, we're not looking to change the floor plan layout of, uh, uh, of any of the units. Obviously, some of the plans on the third floor will have some impact by the reconstruction of these gable ends, but we're you know, putting back windows that are very similar in, uh, in uh, um, proportion and detail to the, uh, to the original mansion. Again, trying to recall as much of that historical, that. Uh, um, character defining features of the original building. Um, so again, um, what you see here is the first floor plan. Again, uh, mentioning that we've got two units per floor. There's uh, this front entrance that faces uh, this, this first bedroom unit that faces Flax Hill, the side entrance here into the center lobby with the stair and a unit to the rear. Again, the units themselves are not changing, but the, the major impact from a, from a floor plan standpoint is really just the wraparound porch here that connects the two entrances. And as uh, um, Attorney Sauchi mentioned, the reconstruction of this, port, uh, of this porch forces us to slide these four uh, existing parking spaces a little bit closer to Flax Hill. Uh, We've got some kind of before and after views from an elevation standpoint. The west elevation is what faces the street, so you can see how it exists now, what we're looking to propose. Also, as part of this project, we're looking to uh, pull off the vinyl siding to uh, uh, expose and, and see what the condition of the existing siding is. Um, but we're looking to uh, um, uh, go back to the historic character of the original building where there's brick on the first floor and then we've got some type of sidewall shingles on the upper floors. Again, uh, south elevation, this is the side elevation entrance into the existing entrance here. This shows the addition of the gable end on the south side, the covering of the, of the uh, side entrance, the wraparound porch, and the, uh, and, and the, the uh, new roof on, on top of the tower. Again, uh, coloration, We're, uh, um, we've uh, tried to see if we could find uh, it, peel through some of the layers of the, ex of the uh, existing siding. We had a hard time getting to a point without doing some major demolition. So we've really gone back to, gone to a color scheme that uh, is historic in nature. Um, these colors come from um, a, a historic palette. Um, uh, typically found in, uh, in New England. So, uh, you know, the existing brick will remain on the ground floor. 
We put the, we've got Tuscan columns holding up the, holding up the roof. The existing will, uh, windows will remain, but we'll add new, add new trims to whatever is missing below the, uh, um, below the vinyl siding. We'll paint the trim red and we'll highlight um, various elements of the, the uh, um, existing building, again, using a very historical color palette. Again, uh, materials, I think, is just, is just uh, uh, representative of what I just explained. Kind of see a three color palette here. Um, new architectural uh, shingles on the, uh, on the uh, gable end roof structures, uh, uh, the single shingle siding. Um, if we can't uh, 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 restore, if you will, the existing siding once we pull the vinyl siding off. And then you see various types of uh, trims that will uh, that, that will use a composite trim that uh, is, is paintable, but also historic in nature. And here's a view, uh, uh, an expanded view of, uh, uh, of the Ferris building. To the rear, um, we, uh, uh, as uh, Attorney Sauchi noted, we are um, taking down the uh, existing carriage house. Uh, when we went out to the site and surveyed that building and reviewed it, we uh, um, noticed that a lot of the character, character defining um, elements, both inside and outside of the building, have been really altered over the history of that, uh, uh, the, the long history of that project. Um, so we, we, we really felt that there, there weren't pieces that were worth saving. Um, but that being said, we wanted to use elements of that existing building that you'll see when we start to talk about the, uh, the, the exterior architecture of it that fits very well in the, uh, uh, the historic nature um, of that carriage house. So what we have is a uh, building that's essentially on four levels. It takes advantage of the uh, uh, sloping uh, terrain of the site so that on three sides that I'm highlighting here are uh, three stories and the side to the south is what tucks into the side of the hill. So this interior courtyard, uh, corridor, I'm sorry, is below grade, but each of these three units have exposure to the, uh, to the exterior. Um, up on the first level, again, we're really at a point where we've got um, uh, um, the units that are stacking. There is an uh, exterior corridor um, that connects to each of these units. So entrance into the first, second, and third floor are all directly from the exterior, where the basement plan entrance into the units are off of an enclosed corridor. There's parking adj adjacent, uh, an entry porch that marks the, the entrance, uh, or the point of access to come to the building, get in this exterior corridor or into either of the two stairs to take you down below to the basement or to the upper floors above. There also is, is a, a, a area of uh, covered parking for two parking spaces. Um, second and third floor are really, uh, uh, really identical in uh, configuration. And what we really have here is a combination of studio units, one bedroom units and two bedroom units scattered um, uh, throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout each of the floor plates. Um, elevations, you can, you can see what I was talking about, how this building tucks into the site. So on the major north elevation and, and on the west and east, the building is three stories. You can start to see the gray dropping off and you can see how you can, uh, how there is uh, light and natural air ventilation into the, uh, into the lower level. Again, the elements of uh, this building from an uh, um, elevation standpoint that we picked up from the original um, carriage house building are the, in the materials using a clapboard siding um, at the first floor level up to a horizontal belt line. With a, with a slight shingle flare. And then from the second and third floor up is uh, again, sidewall shingles. Um, the existing building and a building, you know, a, uh, a carriage house typology building of this type, again, similar to the Ferris Mansion is that we've got um, overhangs and, and uh, projected uh, uh, rakes and eaves 
and we've also picked up in a number of areas the use of um, of a uh, um, brackets to uh, to hold up the projected um, rakes as well as some uh, composite trim uh, gable uh, penta uh, pediment um, trim work. On the south elevation is this is the only point of the project where it really reveals itself as four stories. You can see, you can see that we've also added um, a Juliet balcony, if you will. It's really only a foot deep. It allows um, each of these units in the living dining rooms to get a uh, um, operable door. So you get much more natural light. You, you know, in the shoulder se seasons, when you, uh, uh, when a resident is looking for uh, natural light uh, and ventilation, that they'll be able to open their doors but these porches are not occupiable because they are so shallow. And it helps uh, from a massing standpoint to also help to, uh, you know, to break up the uh, um, field of this, uh, this four-story uh, four elevation. Again, color uh, is very reminiscent of what we're um, utilizing at the Ferris Mansion building so that there's a a visual tie between the two buildings. And again, very similar uh, color palette and very similar detailing um, that's, used, uh, that's used throughout the, um, the, the, the two facilities to really kind of create a nice cohesive uh, project between the two. Um, this shows you the, uh, um, the view of the building and how it fits in. This is the garden building at the rear of the site. They do have deeper porches but you can kind of see here that uh, this is the shallow, uh, shallow Juliet balcony. These are the open walkways that uh, allow access into, um, into the units. It's really kind of a nice feature in some regard because it, it uh, on the units on the first, second, and third floor is that now you have the ability to have windows on both ends of your building. Uh, so again, natural light, natural ventilation is, is able to uh, flow through the units again in the in the shoulder seasons. Last thing that I would uh, would would mention is that um, this on the site there are no new pole mounted fixtures. The only light fixtures are building mounted. There are um, three wall packs that are located um, along the uh, um, northern side of the building. And then there's some, which are cutoff fixtures, which you can see is, is uh, down in here. And there are a number of ceiling mounted fixtures that are um, exterior down lights. And what this photometric plan shows is that all along the property line to the north is that we've got no light bleed. And, uh, and you can really kind of start to see the, the loops and arcs here that show what the extent of the uh, light that's illuminated from uh, each of these wall packs. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation and uh, um, I'll turn it back to, uh, to uh, Attorney Sauchi. Thank you, Mark. Um, I don't know if any of the commissioners have any questions of Mark. Well, Liz, uh, I'm not sure whether it's you or Mark. Um, I do have a question. Is there recreational space uh, built, built into this for the residents? Yes, there is an entire recreation plan that identifies the required and proposed recreation areas and the amenities that are provided. Um, that plan was revised and I believe we've submitted it with hard copy, um, um, electronic copies yesterday and hard copies today, but it meets the requirements of uh, the de-resident zone for the number of units on site for minimum recreation area. And and I'll go out on a limb and say that there's no ax throwing in those recreational areas. <laughs> um, at this point, I don't know if you'd like to hear from uh, Chris DeAngelis. If so, that's fine. Uh, but before, if you do want to hear from him, I don't want to neglect to, to let you know that uh, many of the required SEAC sign-offs have been received, and those include the Fire Department, Water Pollution Control Authority, South Norfolk Electric and Water, the Health Department, and traffic mobility and parking. Uh, we are waiting for comments from the Department of Public Works 
and uh, the application at the request of Dory Wilson was forwarded to Dana Laird, the chairman of the Historical Commission. I have not heard from her or been contacted by her. And what is Chris going to speak to us about? Well, Chris is the project engineer in case you'd like to just have him uh, walk you through the site plan, but frankly, I think it's rather self-explanatory. But if you'd like to hear anything, uh, if you'd like to hear from Chris about utilities or how this, the site functions, he's certainly available. But if you'd prefer not to, uh, we can wait until public hearing if you'd like. Uh, that sounds fine to me, unless there's a commissioner who has a specific question. Well, I have, I have one question for Attorney Sachi. Sure. Uh, my qu you, there are five deed restricted units. That's correct. The rest of the units, you said that the current rents for the people who live there now are about $1,500. Is that for a one bedroom, two bedroom? That's the average. Uh, the rents are about 76% of Norwalk's average median income. Uh, okay. But the $1,500, $1,560 is the average across the different products that are offered today. Now, will that remain the same for the non deed restricted properties? In other words, we're not replacing affordable housing with affordable housing that isn't quite affordable as affordable. Um, if I understand your question, the, the five deed restricted will meet the uh, 830G requirements. The right. remaining 41 will be um, not market rate, but not under the workforce housing. There'll be that intermediate product that serves that market that isn't met by either. And they will still be affordable at a certain percentage of the uh, Norwalk media, area median income. What would the approximate rent be per, for a two bedroom, what would the average rent be as compared to the average rent that currently exists on those properties? Well, that's what I, that's what I said. The average rent for the non-workforce, for the 41 of the 45 would be, the average is about 1560. And workforce housing is a little bit less than that. Okay, so it'd be about 1560. And the current housing stock that's there, the average rent is 1560? That's about right. That's about the average that, for the current housing stock for, that, for, this, um, for this particular product, for this particular market. Uh, those one or two bedroom rents you're talking about? Um, uh, Commissioner Sumter, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't, if you'd let me, um, could Kevney Moses come on? He is with Workforce Partners and he could answer those specific questions. I don't want to misspeak about what the rents are for Studio 1, 2, and 3. Kevney, are you on? Michelle, can you do that? Yeah, Liz, I'm here. Uh, good evening, Commission. This is Kevney Moses with Workforce Partners. So we, we'd be happy to put some of that information uh, together for you guys. I'd rather get something prepared that's a little bit more cohesive than just off the cuff. But as Liz said, um, that 1500 1560 is an average over the aggregate um, of the units within our portfolio. Uh, again, that's about 76% of mm -hmm. area median income for Norwalk. We know what the people who live there now are paying. Again, on average throughout our portfolio? Not your portfolio, the people who live in that space right now. There are a whole bunch of living units, dwelling units right now that people live in. And I'm just wondering if we're replacing affordable housing with affordable housing that's less affordable. Or are we replacing affordable housing with a better housing that's equally affordable? Do you see? Do you understand my question? Am I being clear? I I do understand your question. Those new units, um, purely because they're new units, will would would most likely carry the same rent uh, or slightly better, uh, and, and by that I mean um, slightly more costly. Uh, than units that are, say, 15, 20, or 30 years old. Um, granted, many of those units have already been renovated and are, are very much so modernized, which is part of our ethos, but notwithstanding, these are brand new units. Um, so I can't say specifically if they would match or be slightly higher than the existing rents. I think that's going to come down to what the market obviously dictates. But what I can guarantee is that those rents for the new units would still fall within that same range 
um, of, of 60 to 100 percent of area median income. But Andy Ayala, who is also with Workforce Partners, might have uh, a little bit more perspective on this than, than I do at the moment. The people who currently live there, they will have to vacate, obviously, right? Uh, I, I'm sorry, Kevin, you want to just handle that? Oh, I can. Sorry, this, this, is, this is Andy Ayala. Can, can everyone hear me? Go ahead, Andy. Okay, great. Um, no, I just want to kind of address. So in terms of your last question, um, the, the current carriage house that's um, going to be demolished to put the new proposed structure, we, um, we've, we've actually um, already got a couple of those units uh, vacant and we don't plan to reoccupy them until we get you know, through the hearing. So we, we won't, the goal is not to move people out. The goal is just to, um, as residents, uh, uh, leases are expiring, we're um, you know, either accommodating them in other parts of our portfolio or, um, or just kind of moving them within the property to, to kind of keep them within our, our uh, portfolio. But, uh, allow us to um, demolish the building. So we're, uh, so that's the plan for, for the existing uh, structure. And so far we've been able to, uh, to accommodate folks. Um, the, the, the rents for the new building will be, as, as Kevin has indicated, will be within our current target range. Um, a lot of it you know, depends on just keeping our costs uh, constrained. And uh, so as we've been um, you know, working with uh, all of our third parties and, and uh, have talked to um, zoning staff about this as well. You know, we, our, our goal is to keep those costs essentially um, as far down as we can so we can keep the rents where we, where we um, currently have our portfolio. So, um, so to some degree, it depends on where our final construction budget heads out. But as of today, where our budget is, we, the plan is to be able to keep the rents very similar um, to where they are today at that site and within our portfolio. Okay. Obviously with the yeah. unit mix changes. Um, so the current carriage house has a different unit mix than the new proposed unit uh, carriage house. And our portfolio has a different unit mix than this particular structure. So it's very difficult to tell you an exact average rent comparison, but, but we will, the goal is to keep them within that 60 to 100% AMI range. And as, our, as of our current budget today, and our current rents pr proposed, there'll be very, uh, we will be able to maintain that and the rents will be similar to, to what we offer today at this site and at our other sites in our portfolio. Uh, Kevin, I kind of hear what you're saying and I understand we're not really trying to control your rents, but at the same time, we're a zoning commission, but we are concerned about people and we are concerned about living conditions as well as people being able to survive and live in, in South Norwalk. And that's kind of why, where we're coming from. At the same time, we'd, we'd love to see new units and nice units, but I think the question had to be some, the question is really about the people being able to, or some folks being able to still stay in that area. Because what we're finding is that oftentimes when units are renovated, then those people that are there can't come back in the same area. Well, well our whole, uh, the whole ethos of our company is to provide uh, workforce housing for the, the um, residents in the city of Norwalk. So we, uh -huh. as a normal course of business, you know, when we bought this property, you know, right. we, and as we've done with other properties in Norwalk, we do, um, you know, kind of do some um, what we call a revival of the properties to kind of give them a lift in terms of, uh, you know, doing some some upgrades to the units themselves and the upgrades to the exteriors of the property. And uh, for those who live um, uh, in Norwalk, you, you might have seen our signs and some of the upgrades we've done to some of the properties we have across the city of Norwalk. So our standard is to is to provide a better quality housing for people who are, um, you know, of average means. Uh, and that's why, as Attorney Suchi has indicated, we offer discounts as a standard for people who we think should be able to live and work in Norwalk, like teachers, like nurses, like 
uh, municipal workers, et cetera. And so our, our goal is really to be able to provide that um, quality. Okay. Where are your other properties located? We have a property at 30 West Avenue, right, uh, right, almost right across from the mall. Um, uh -huh. Property um, at 50 Connecticut Avenue, uh, right across from the old uh, uh, Toys R Us. We have property at um, uh, another property right down the road from this one at uh, 138 Flax Hill. Uh, we have property, a um, few properties near Norwalk Hospital. We have one at uh, 14 Bedford Avenue, uh, 21 Clinton Avenue, uh, 31 Ferris Avenue. Okay. Uh, North Taylor, 146 West Cedar, um, 8 Union Avenue, and those are just some properties. But and we have the same kind of IVE signs that you you might see. Uh, we're we're branded under the IVE uh, um, IVE Living brand. So there's a black signs with the blue letters that you may have seen if you've been driving around. Um, now that you mention, I have seen those signs, but I wasn't familiar with your company, but I like the idea of um, rents being kept somewhat affordable for workforce housing, rather than having one or two or 10% workforce housing within the city. And again, it's a bit out of our purview, but at the same time, I hear what you're talking about. Okay. Liz, uh, you're looking for a public hearing on this matter? Yeah. Uh, yes, if you could schedule it for August 6th, that would be most appreciated. Steve, uh, can we get it on the agenda for the 6th? Steve, you're muted. Oh, yeah, just be a late night, that's all. Okay. Um, it's either if that or we're not. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. If it's going to be a late, late night, is it? I mean, is there another date that rather than because it sounds like you're. We'd have to. We'd have to move it. We'd have to move it into September. When is our first meeting in September? Hold on one sec. I got to move. Okay. Yeah, so your, your meeting schedule is August 6th, August 19th, then September 3rd. Uh, Liz, can you manage with September 3rd? Um, uh, I, I would prefer August 6th, but if the commission's pleasure is that you don't want to have a very late night on the 6th, then I, I guess we really, um, we really don't have much choice. My difficulty is I'm not around between the 15th and the 29th. Yeah, we understand. I don't know if you have an interest to, to schedule special meetings for, for perhaps this and perhaps um, um, the Water Street project. I don't know what your, your preference is, but it's unfortunate we would lose an entire month. Right. Uh, Steve, what do we currently have scheduled for the sixth? Uh, we have, um, so we have the uh, Glover Avenue continuation of just the discussion of the application. So, you know, what is that? Uh, if you're going to try to ballpark, that's an hour, hour and a half discussion at the max. I'm, I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, the continuation of the Wilson Avenue public hearing. So, maybe another. 45 minutes, I'm completely guessing here. Um, you have the special permit application for this, so that's maybe an hour or so. Uh, the Water Street discussion is another 30 minutes, uh, and then some small administrative matters. I know Attorney Suchi had the um, main Ave, two, the, the former BJ site, or for lack of a better term, 272 main Ave. They're looking for an extension of time, so that's five minutes of discussion. Nothing is fine. Yeah, I can't recall if there's anything else. Well, I've never seen a lawyer talk for just five minutes on anything. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that in August um, uh, I want to hold a third um, uh, special meeting 
Um, let's push it back to September. Um, I mean, the, I mean, I, 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 no blame here, but I mean, part of the problem is the is is Attorney Sanchez's unavailability. Um, so I'm not uncomfortable pushing it uh, to the first that first meeting in September. If it's, you, all, if it's at all helpful, the uh, the main avenue matter could easily go over to September. There's that we're not under any deadline. We're not under any real time constraint. That frees up a, a little bit. Um, but it's, it would just be unfortunate that we would we would go from now till, in essence, uh, six weeks, seven weeks. Right. Unless you're not going on vacation there, attorney. I'm I'm going to be hanging out with my family. I haven't I haven't done anything with them in a year. Well, we got family um, too, you know. Yeah, well, there's a vacation. The uh, the other option is to cancel your. Um, August 19th meeting um, and then do something, you know, do some, uh, Liz, what, what days were you gone again? I'm sorry. Uh, 15 to 29. I don't really think that helps you. The no. only thing would be maybe the week of the following week, sometimes the week of the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, the 10th. That's the other option is to do cancel your second August meeting and do something in between the two before, before she goes away. It's whatever your pleasure is. Uh, I understand the difficulty you're under and, and the, the length of time that these hearings take. And, and uh, so whatever you decide is, is fine with us. Steve, do we have the time to do that? Uh, time in terms of? In terms of the specific date? date? Yeah, I mean, if we're looking yeah, at- Yeah, we can. We're looking at August 6th, when would the second meeting be? I believe she's gone the 15th, so you could, you know, assuming the availability, you could do something the 13th or the 14th. Hmm. What's I, uh, I won't be there. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> okay. I like, I like, Mr. Chairman, you said September the 3rd. Why don't we leave it like that? That answers that question. Thank you. There. Everybody comfortable with that? Push this back till September 3rd? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. We'll schedule it for the third. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Have a happy. Uh, oh, I'll see you on the sixth. You're not done with me yet, Mr. Oh, before everyone heads out. I, I was looking at that picture. I thought maybe you, that picture that was behind you, you were there now. No, I wish I was. Sorry. Hey, look thank like you all for your time. Look like Italy to me. It is. I all thought right, let's, so. Uh, let's knock. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, continue with our agenda. Um, the uh, East Norwalk TOD study. Steve, you want to give us an update? Sure. So I um, can't remember the last time we met, but we did have two public presentations on the plan, um, mm -hmm. kind of went how I would expect it. And Stephanie, can, um, she can you know chime in as well and correct me if I go astray. Um, but, you know, the... There's there's opposition to elements of the plan which was expected. Um, I you know in reading a lot of the emails that come in the comments, I think there's also a misunderstanding about um, about the plan itself and some elements of it. With that, and you know I understand the concerns regarding traffic. I think they're all fair and good questions to ask. Um, the next step is really we need to get the uh, process started of amending the plan of conservation development. So that'll be something that the Planning Commission uh, takes up and considers uh, next week, which will be the first step. And there'll be several public hearings subsequent, subsequent to that. So that, that's kind of where we're at right now. Okay. Um, any questions for Steve on that? All right. If not, uh, the industrial zone study. Uh, Getting very close, the purchase order was just approved today. So I think the last thing is the mayor actually has to sign the actual contract and then we can get started. So any day now it'll be ready to go. So they'll probably be, um, you know, the, we'll get the group together in a few weeks, I would think once they, they're gonna have to start, you know, reading the POCD in depth, reading the zoning regs, getting an understanding of things and doing some site visits. So that, that'll happen over the next few weeks or months or so. 
Okay, and uh, the big one, the zoning regs? Yeah, I'm going to, who do we have? Um, Michelle, can we move, I don't know who Mr. Grombley is, can you remove him out from, I mean, doesn't need to be on, unless he's a new member that I'm not aware of, but we could probably move him out of here. No offense to Mr. Grombley. I got to find, I, I made a couple tweaks to the, um, that I wanted to get your take on before we did anything. The last, and, and it's pretty much ready to go um, outside of that, but I just wanted to get your take on a couple things. First being that, you know, we talked about the, um, the DBE requirements, you know, uh, for, for firms looking to submit that there should be some kind of representation from some kind of uh, minority or disenfranchised business. Um, talked about that, Lou and I had a conversation with Sharon Connors in purchasing. She didn't want us to put something in there that was so stringent that we would disqualify somebody. So we talked about ways to uh, put the put the language in there so it's, you know, almost like they, you know, a way to get extra points is another way to think about it. So it's something that we want to see and we're encouraging, but not disqualifying somebody just because they can't meet that standard. It may affect their overall grading if they can't comply with that, but it's maybe as a way to um, encourage that. So this why, this language kind of carries a couple of to, Excuse me, Steve. Why wouldn't they be yep. able to meet that standard? How would it, why would it disqualify them? Well, well, say they say they didn't have any of that uh, requirement in their firm, so they, their entire firm didn't meet any of those standards. They would uh -huh. still be allowed to submit under the RFP, but it, it's it could cost them points in the grading and uh, qualification process. Are you saying that they wouldn't have MBAs available or something? I don't quite understand that. The, they, it, not, yeah, they might not. They might not meet that standard. Why wouldn't they meet it? Nate, I, I don't know. Nate let, me, let, 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 let me try and explain. Um, okay. I was pushing for uh, a percentage. Uh, but this is all new. Um, the Zoning Commission has never done this. And in fact, uh, the only folks that do it on anything like a regular basis uh, is uh, the redevelopment agency because they receive uh, substantial federal, federal dollars. My, uh -huh. my sense here is um, I think this is important. I think we ought to do this with, with every significant contract we issue, but I'm willing uh, to try it at this level. Uh, I don't, I agree with you. I don't see any reason why the firms that are bidding can't find, if they don't have uh, uh, the resources in-house, why they can't find a partner to work with. Uh, you know, I, I've done over a hundred million dollars in, in uh, projects and every single one of them has had a, a DBE uh, requirement. Uh, and it's very infrequent that, uh, and very infrequent indeed, that uh, they can't find a partner. Um, so, I mean, I, I think um, once uh, the, the staff sees that these firms are going to make good faith effort, uh, it's going to be easier for us to insist on this going forward. Um, again, I, I agree with the you. First, the first time that, that uh, zoning is doing it. And I agree with you, Lou, and, it, and by now, this is 2020. We, again, I need to say, if you did it back probably at least 20 years ago, you're I telling me 19, that they, I started doing it in the 1980s. You did it in the 1980s and you're gonna tell me they can't do it. And I just think that they're taking the easy way out and we have to get past that because if we don't get past that, how will you allow smaller firms to be a part of the city, particularly when we are using federal dollars. It, it would be a different thing if these were private. And I'm just, at, at this point in my life, I'm, I'm just tired of hearing people saying what they can't do. They gotta start talking about possibilities and what can happen and stop making excuses. I don't, 
I don't think you and I are in a different place. And I, I, I agree and, with you. And I think after this going forward, this is going to be regular part of our business. And I think we sort of set the stage for uh, the city to do this going forward on on all again all significant city projects i mean there you know two ways to approach it uh, one is you put in a percentage another is you literally carve out um, money for uh, dbe uh, participation um, and i i think we ought to be pushing uh, for that and what was that what was the thinking behind not pursuing the percentage? Steve, well, I'll let Steve speak for himself. Well, in, in talking with Sharon, she, she was concerned if you put that in as a requirement and there was a firm that didn't have that, they didn't meet any of the um, thresholds that are outlined that they would not bid or they wouldn't be qualified to bid. I mean, I know they they can always go out and farm out a portion of their work to somebody else, so that that's another option. I was going to ask, and that would be bad. Why? It's not bad. It's well, I, the way this is done. <laughs> no, it I'm saying so if they couldn't meet the qualification, aren't we actually saying we don't want to hire them? Isn't that the point of a statement like this? That's what well, I, I think. The only difference think. between this and Go ahead, Nate. No, I was just saying that. Why make it so easy for them to say what's bad? Let them decide. They can do it. And it's about time that they start doing it. Particularly, there are federal dollars involved, which means all of us that pay taxes are involved. And it's high time that Norwalk, like many other cities in the state of Connecticut, they get involved with MBEs, DBEs, or whatever, and stop making it easy. It's like the old adage, I can't find anybody that's qualified. That is a bunch of baloney, and we got to stop it. If we don't stop it, then it's going to continue for years and years and years. And I would tell Sharon the same thing. She can't just wonder of what could because it doesn't work like that anymore. I don't think it should. I mean, we're bigger than well, that. Well, just and to be better. clear, just to be clear, so that I don't, Sharon didn't say the city doesn't do that. They, that like when they do the bridge projects and the larger projects, that's required in there. And the city yes. actually puts in the bid documents that they have to have somebody that's monitoring that. So the city has a third party that ensures that when somebody uh, makes a claim that they are, you know, they, they, they meet the DBE requirements or something. This, the city's not actually checking it as a third party that's doing that because the city doesn't have the ability to follow up. But with a smaller project and it's kind of a specialty niche, you know, consulting versus bridge repair, that, that's why some of the differences lie. I mean, from my perspective, I would rather have no sentence than have this sentence. It doesn't, it basically, says, oh, well, if it's convenient for you, <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if it were well, convenient, we wouldn't need the sentence. So if we're trying to make a statement and actually move a needle, then I think this is useless. Uh, if that's not what we're trying to do and we're just trying to be politically correct, well, then the sentence is great, in my opinion. I agree with you. Yeah, so just down below, um, as part of the scoring criteria, we did put that in as another um, as another item that that counts towards the scoring. How much of the score? Uh, I don't think it's broken out by percent. I mean, look, if your pleasure is to put it in as a percent, we can rewrite it and if, tell me what you want for a percent, and we'll include it. I mean, my thinking is. I, again, I, I am not here to say if this, what this body is trying, especially, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I don't know what was discussed, but if we are trying to actually move the needle, we need something very strong. If that's not what we're trying to do, then 
like I don't know if we voted on this. <laughs> what we did not we did not vote on this. This was um, my idea, um, and I believe we are trying to move the needle. Um, right. Typically, uh, <clears throat> when I've included this, um, uh, it it's it can be all over the place. But uh, typically, it's ten, roughly 10% 10 or less uh, of the scoring uh, for the organizations uh, who are bidding on the project. I thought it was a good idea, Lou. And I wasn't at the meeting, but I listened to the two hours of, um, of the meeting. And I liked the idea because it was easier to listen because it was all right there and clear. And we have to begin to move this needle because if we don't do it, then who? That's my um, feeling. And it's gotta be done. I've been around long enough and I've heard all of the reasons why it can't happen. It can happen. They did it in Atlanta and they did it other places years ago. And, if, and I thought, thought it was a great idea. And we gotta stop making excuses why things can't happen. I'm sorry, Galen, did you want to say something? You're muted. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to keep going back and forth between uh, the video and no video. Oh. But uh, I agree. I think. We do need to be stronger, but. Well, Steve, um, let's have the staff re rewrite it. <clears throat> and um, why don't we make it 10% of the scoring? Um, now, again, I, as I said, I've, I've done over $100 million of, of these projects. Every once in a while, um, a, f a firm will put in a bid and indicate they couldn't find someone to partner with. Um, and I think if a firm does that, they have to explain why, and we have to determine uh, if that's acceptable to us. Um, but why don't we, why don't you rewrite this with percentages and uh, give that, uh, the DBE uh, requirement, 10 points. Um, and, and can we just do a little market research to make sure that 10% is still the industry standard for people doing innovative work in this area? Uh, I, I don't, I don't I have ask. an idea. Doing it in this uh, uh, specific area, I don't, I think all that's needed is a conversation with the redevelopment agency. They do a lot of projects. Uh, and in fact, you know, Steve has legitimate concern um, about, uh, I had a staff member who addressed the issue about whether these were legitimate uh, MBE or DBE firms. Steve doesn't have that staff. The city doesn't seem to have that staff. They use a contractor. It seems to me we should either have permission to use that contractor or ask for the assistance on this one project as we move into this uh, of the redevelopment agency, because they do have staff that does it. It's a good idea. All right, Steve, those are your marching orders. Okay, gotcha. Right. Thank you. Uh, Steve, do you have anything else for us? Nope, that's enough for tonight. Okay, then we just have approval of the minutes for the June 24th meeting. So moved. All right, Michael uh, moves. There a second? I'll second. Okay, Galen seconds. Uh, any discussion? All right, if not, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? I have to abstain. Okay. I abstain. Abstain. Josh, abstain. Oh, Josh, 
Nate and Stephanie abstain. Right. One, two, three, four. Still gives us um, uh, the numbers we need to approve. Uh, finally, any comments from commissioners? Good meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lou, for taking that step. Motion to adjourn. Oh, Josh makes the motion. Thank Make, you. Next, all those I'll in favor? It. Yes. Aye. 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 Good night. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Bye. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. So long. Stay strong. <laughs> all right. We all set. Bye, Michelle. Bye. Have a good night. Nice.